Attention, all shopping mall visitors. Roll out. Play now on PC. The best tank world is World of Tanks.
Christmas, everybody. Are you ready to sing a little Jingle Bells? Yes. Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. Oh, the fields would go laughing all the way. Bells on Bob Dylan, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and say a sleighing song tonight. Jingle bells, you jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Hello and a very warm welcome to Tankmus 2023. And first of all, a massive thank you to the Victory Rolls. Uh, we'll be hearing a lot from all from them later on. I'm Richard Cutland from World of Tanks, and previously I served for 30 years in the British Army with the Royal Tank Regiment. My name's Nick Wyness. I'm the head of marketing at the Tank Museum, and believe it or not, I started working here about 20 years ago. 20 years. 20, 20 years. years. Uh, and I'm David Bagley, or as many of you know, is Ikibu. I'm head of community. I stream on World of Tanks and I help with our community and our media activities. So please settle back for the next few hours. We've got some fantastic content for you. We've got interviews, guest museums, as I said, a lot more from the Victory Rolls. And we've also got giveaways and a whole lot more. We'll also be looking at a really exciting new uh, project, but more about that later on. First of all, Richard, I just want to compliment you on this <laughs> fine jumper that you're wearing. <laughs> so, have you talked me into it? Available in uh, all good stores, um, especially the Tank Museum shop, of course, and online, I believe. Absolutely. Well, of course, the Tank Museum is a registered charity, and one of the best ways that you can support museums like the Tank Museum is by visiting their online shops and doing some of your Christmas shopping there. And interestingly, if you'd like to get your hands on a jumper of the sort that uh, Richard is modelling here, we are doing a sale over this weekend on this season's Christmas jumper. Simply head to tankmuseumshop.org, and when you check out, enter the code STREAM. 23 and you can get five pounds off this exquisite christmas jumper bargain. bargain but now for those who are new to the tank museum we've got our next video which gives you a little bit of an outline of who we are and what we do the tank museum bovington uk the home of the tank the home of tank fest and home to one of the finest collections of armor in the world the Tank Museum tells the story of the tank and the people that served in them. There are 300 vehicles here, most of which are displayed inside the museum's large halls. In fascinating modern exhibitions, you'll come face to face with tanks that have seen action in every major conflict since the First World War. From the world's first tank to some of the latest, there is an extensive World War II collection and unique examples of the prototypes that didn't quite make the grade. With a workshop facility and an extensive archive and supporting collection, 
the Tank Museum is a center of armored excellence, sharing its passion with a global audience on its YouTube channel. As a not-for-profit organization, our work is funded entirely by people like you. You can support us by backing our Patreon, buying something from our online store, joining our friends scheme, or simply by making a donation using PayPal giving. And welcome back. So this time, of course, if you're unfamiliar with our community event, we have a holiday up starting. This is where in-game you can take part in all the cool activities by either dressing your garage, completing Vinnie Jones activities, your chaffy missions, helping your cat out, as well as buying some large boxes and playing the game in all festive mood and atmosphere. Here you should be able to see some cool assets soon, I hope, uh, being able to see some of how that looks in-game, as well as how you can take part in our cool end of year activity. But before any of that, of course, we can go to a cool video that we have with Vinnie Jones that we did as a trailer for our Holiday Ops ad events, which hopefully you'll see soon. Over here. Yeah, a word, please. I don't know what's worse. The fact you don't know the difference between a set of car keys and a, a rake, or that somehow, in the name of rude old shiny nose, you thought I wouldn't notice a scratch the size of Lapland right outside the bossy front door, huh? Sir, sir. Uh, 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 how are you going to pay for this, eh? Chocolate coins? No, 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 no. You're not blaming sir. the reindeer this time. I'm talking no, to you. I'm talking to you. to move back. You're too close to the camera. There you go. Merry Christmas. Well, I just wanted to make sure you got my memo and you're going to sort it out. Yes. Yeah, yes, I will, Senator. Certainly. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, that's great to hear. Okay. All right. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Vinny Jones. Santa. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Santa. I ain't going to lie. I'm out. Out. What do you mean, you're out? I handle the nice list. You handle the naughty list. That's how it works. I need my enforcer. And you're the best there is. Lads! It's naughtier than ever out there. Knuckles! Office cookie thief. No, 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 no. You don't look like a filth, man. Don't bother. Bones. A non-brusher just checked in for his appointment. Whew. Garlic. Clarence, another disabled parking space stealer. I'll only be here a couple of minutes. <laughs> Gentlemen, we have a code white. He claims his vehicle was damaged, and he just happened to spend the whole match stuck behind the bushes. We know the truth. He's a camper! Please! Don't leave me here. Camp here as long as you like, mate. It was only the one time. I can't make it do. I just needed the XP. Please. Look, nobody loves the festive season more than me. But I've got a new job. Whatever they're paying you, I'll double it. It ain't about the money. Well, what is it then? Well, for a start, they've offered me a sweet company car. What's wrong with the old sleigh? Let me show you. <laughs> Come feel <fill> them. <laughs> Reminds me of my first sleigh, mate. 
job is not worth the chocolate coins. Well, Santa, check out the present I've got you. Get to the moon. Well, otherwise he's going to turn us all into meat pies. Oh, nice one, Billy. Fire! Damn it. That's the spirit, Santa. <laughs> Drop in any time, old man. And a Merry Christmas to you too, Jones. You know what? You'll make a pretty good commander. La 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 la. And we hope that you enjoyed that trail as much as we did. As you can see, we, uh, we visited Vinny, asked him to where he got his cool coat from, and here we go. Santa, I'm <laughs> gonna lie. <laughs> That's a very excellent impression. Like I, can't, I can't do it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we do have other activities going on, for instance. We will have giveaways throughout the stream, but first, as many of you know, we will have drops today, which is where you're gonna be for the first 90 minutes, be able to claim either a five times five XP missions, a VIC, or an Astrum Rex. And then after two hours or 180 minutes, you'll be able to get one day of premium, a tier seven combat car or the Lorraine 40T. All you gotta do is just make sure you have linked your account, you're watching and you're actively participating and you'll do just fine and be able to claim your mystery drop throughout the stream. Um, yeah, so would you like to give us an announcement and some info on the upcoming? And yeah, of course, Nick. So planning already underway for my favourite time of the year for next year, Tank Fest 2024. Uh, really looking forward to it, of course. Yeah, shall I deliver this in the style of Vinnie Jones? Do it. Well, Tank Fest <laughs> is our most important fundraising event of the year. Three days. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll knock that on the head up <laughs> before, I, before I get sued. I think this might have been Vinnie's actual coat, you know, I can almost smell the aggression. Um, <laughs> Three-day spectacular, world famous for being the world's finest display of historic moving armour. We've got living history, of course, we've got arena action, we've got the British Army, and this year in particular, as you probably know, we will have a very special vehicle uh, making its Tank Fest debut. Uh, full programme will be announced early next year, but tickets are available now, so if you're interested, get them whilst they're hot, go to tankmuseum.org. Look for Tank Fest and buy your tickets now before they're all sold out. Uh, but this evening, we are giving away four pairs of Tank Fest Unlimited tickets for Saturday, the 29th of June. These are effectively premium Tank Fest tickets. So to enter, all you need to do is keep an eye on the comments and look for the Gleam link and follow that link in order to enter the giveaway. I'm looking forward to it already. Oh, absolutely. And of course, yep. for anybody watching that perhaps has never ex had the experience of Tank Fest, here's a little reminder about what it's all about. A good tank driver must make a quick appreciation of the ground ahead. He must be alert for obstacles in his path. Making his approach at the correct speed. Avoid damaging the tank and injuring the crew. The driver knows that with care, he can cross quite safely without any unpleasant surprises that might result in damage to the tank. Skillful driving keeps the tank mobile. Once clear of the obstacle, get away as fast as possible. Tackling an obstacle at the right speed means a better chance of reaching your objective on time.
The Tank Museum Shop, where every penny you spend supports our mission to preserve history. Do is make sure that I pull a random person from the chat throughout. Is everything working okay? Okay, so everything's working okay. I saw a bit of chaos there. So all I'm gonna be doing is pulling a random person from the chat throughout the stream where I click a roll it and I will be pulling a code from one of these doors. All I'm gonna do is go in an order. I don't know which order that they are in. So for instance, right now, I'm gonna click the roll it button here and we have N-D-I-R-E-M. All I need you to do is reach out to us in the DMs or ping one of the moderators. And what you have won is a, hopefully I don't knock this over and break it from this amazing advent calendar is a AMX M449. So all you gotta do is reach out to moderator and we'll make sure you get your code going forward. What I'll do is I'll keep this box to the side so I don't pull it a second time. We're gonna get another one without breaking it. Uh, and the next person, which will be a Faiths, which is F4ITHS Faiths, you have won yourself an AMX 1357. Again, all you have to do is DM us or one of the moderators, just let us know your name and just tell us about this. We will make sure we reach out to you afterwards and keep a record of it. But again, reach out just to be safe. Next up though, we do have another excellent song coming from Victory Rolls who will take you through this next bit. Thank 
We want to bring this strange-looking prototype back to life in time for Tankfest 2024, but we need your help. There's only one of these in the world, and it's the result of an experiment from the 1950s to put the biggest possible gun on a tank. We know it as FV4005. If you play World of Tanks, you'll know it as the sh barn. The 183mm gun housed in this massive turret remains the biggest gun ever fitted to a tank. It's little more than a shed, offering the most basic protection for the crew housed inside, who'd have to manually load the enormous gun. It dates from a time when the fear of war with the Soviet Union and their powerful IS-3 tanks dominated military thinking. Fortunately, the war never came, and other technological developments rendered the FV-4005 obsolete. It was abandoned in 1957. The turret sat in the Tank Museum's car park for around 30 years before it was reunited with a spare Centurion hull and placed as a gate guardian in around 2008. It was given the name Spud after the nickname of Harold Hamilton Taylor, a World War II veteran who also happened to be part of the FV4005 trials, and he also happened to be a workshop volunteer. And like so many of the unusual, quirky, dead-end prototypes found at the Tank Museum, it was pretty much ignored by our visitors in favour of tanks that gained fame from their battlefield exploits. That's until World of Tanks made them all famous, and forgotten tanks like TOG-2, Tortoise, Black Prince, Conway and FV4005 were given a new lease of life as video game superstars. In a partnership between A.W. Hughes, World of Tanks and the Tank Museum, we want to conserve and cosmetically restore the turret, reuniting it with the correct Centurion Mark III chassis. We want to remake the gun cradle and other fittings that were unique to this unusual vehicle. And then we want to display it in full running order before the crowd at Tankfest 2024. We need to raise £20,000 to match the amount generously pledged by World of Tanks. This will cover the costs of the project, which will be undertaken at the A.W. Hughes workshop in Leicestershire. Can you help us? Visit tankmuseum.org forward slash FV4005 to see how you can support us and keep track of our progress. Thanks to FAM for that fantastic video, which really there explains quite clearly all about the restoration of the FV4005 and what an exciting project to be involved in. Now, Nick, uh, how is the fundraising going for a start? Well, incredibly, uh, we released that video about two or three weeks ago now, and we made the fundraising target in, in 24 hours. So thank you very much to everyone who donated and supported us. If you still want to support us, you can. Uh, go to the uh, tankmuseum.org uh, forward slash FV4005, which is the appeal page. And for £50, uh, your donation will support this project and other uh, restoration projects that we have going on at the Tank Museum. And you'll be able to get your name on the back of that vehicle for when it runs at Tankfest 2024. Fantastic. And to give us a bit more information about this incredible restoration and certainly the history behind it, of course, a man who leads... Little or no, should I say, David? Introduction, Mr. David Willey, the creator of the Tank Museum. Firstly, David, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and first of all, for those that perhaps aren't aware, curator. What does the curator do? You nearly said it wrong then again, I did. didn't you? That's yeah. what he does, <laughs> I did. So everyone always confuses that word curator, sometimes with creator. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe you are the creator. I was going to say, job I'm not. I was going to say, I haven't been here that long. Um, uh, what? When I first came here, way back in 2000, a lot of the role of the curator is like looking after stuff and we were trying to put stuff in the right order, cataloguing, collection care, all sorts of bits and pieces that way. Now I personally see my role much more along the lines of um, subject knowledge, a bit about what with the word significance. Mm -hmm. So what, why, why are we doing things like FE 4005, etc.? And um, and obviously a lot of the time we're, we're we're trying to tell the story. So with the YouTube content, with all sorts of other bits and pieces, sometimes I end up doing that role, um, even though you know 
the day jobs, like everybody, organisations can be very, very different um, ac across uh, any individual day. As everyone who's here will have, you know, be able to testify. Okay, so I, I've been to the museum a few times since 2019, but you've always been here. How long have you been at the museum, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, a long, <laughs> lot, it feels a very long time now. <laughs> I, I came back in 2000, um, okay. and it was, again, part of the story behind all this was, if you're a professional museum going for things like grant money, etc., you need people with certain types of qualification. I was a, the first, can you believe, the first qualified museum curator here even though we've had lots of people that are enormously knowledgeable on the subject etc so it's a bit like you know having a doctor's qualification actually you've got to have that even if a lot of the day job doesn't always in include having to need that, that sort of thing so obviously seen a lot of changes in that mm. time over to over the last 20 plus years do you remember your first visit to the tech museum i personally came here like so many people of my age i meet they came with dad uh holiday in dorset um, I've luckily I've still got my photographs and everything. In fact, the, one of them, me standing next to little Willie, is in the guidebook. Um, David Willie, so I had to sit next to little Willie, have my photo taken, sort of thing. So again, it's that generational thing, and of course we have the pleasure here every day seeing that going on. Sometimes a bigger family group now. There's an awful lot more social history. There's lots of other things to entertain everyone, but it's still traditionally that place that dads went with sons. And years later, everyone remembers that as being quite an emotive moment because it's that special day out thing yeah. that, uh, you know, people tend to get on with and all the things we've had to learn as well, just small bits as well. This is one of the few places dads really read to their kids because they're so infused, they pick up details, they pass that on, they want to say, come over here, look what I've just found out. So all of those things. And again, educationally, gold dust, you know, yeah. things that we've all had to learn over time. But yeah, you watch it here every day, you see it being repeated. Now, I think we've got some uh, footage queued up, ready to go, uh, about the, uh, of the FV4005. Uh, so hopefully we can flash that up on the screen. Uh, this footage was recently digitised, wasn't it? Yeah, so it's so not really been seen for some time. It's another one of these amazing things. Uh, look at this beautiful colour footage. What fascinates me about this subject area we're in, and you will all realise this, is constantly more information comes to light on things. So over in the archive, we've got lots of training videos, we've got Betamax, we've got all sorts of things, as well as 16mm, 35mm, 8mm film, and some of that may have been looked at some time ago, but with this particular lot, the archivist, um, Stuart uh, Wheeler at the time, he, he picked a selection, went over to Bewley where they've got the facilities for actually tr uh, copying this material. And looking at this one, it's come back, it's got some other wonderful bits and pieces on it. But here we're seeing FE4005 in its, what we call like its second stage here, or stage two version with the turret. Whether that's a turret, there was two of these, whether that's a turret that actually is here at the museum today, we're not 100% certain. I think this is filmed at a place called Cobham Common. So it's basically this Chertsey site in the backgrounds there. And what we're looking at is obviously some trials of the vehicle that they were filming at the time, which for us, fantastic to get that quality imagery, colour and new to us as well. You know, and again, back to this things will you know we haven't we've got loads more film we need to again copy at some point we're being able to use it on youtube everything else what they're doing there is you're seeing because the gun's so big 183 millimeter based on this 7.2 inch artillery piece it is so big to put on a tank you're going to need a ground anchor and you can see how it's doing there they're backing into the ground so that when that gun fires forward you've got as much of an anchor as possible um, for this huge great gun. They're loading shells here, actually they're stowing the vehicle, so these are going through the back door of that whopping great big uh, turret. Um, relatively thin, 14 mil armour plate on the turret, so it'll stop a bullet, not much else, but you can see that's one of what's called a Hesh round, high explosive squash head, the aim being that it will hit a target, pancake on it, and the sheer blast will send a shockwave all the way through. 
And here's the uh, propellant in a brass case, two part ammunition. And again, you need two loaders. This stuff is so heavy. Um, they're just actually getting it about 12, sometimes 15 rounds put in that um, stowed in the vehicle there. And what, again, one of the things that comes across here, they're filming all this to show how this could be being operated, how it could be being used all the time when we're looking at this vehicle, you've got to kind of remember this is not a prototype, it's a test bed. Mm. They're testing out that gun. Is it going to be possible if we have to, back to what Fan was saying, that idea of the JS-3, the larger Soviet tanks, if we need a gun that can step back on some sort of chassis, Centurion's in front, this is behind, this is going to have to fire and knock out tanks at an enormous distance away. Um, they're looking at, you know, uh, about, I don't know, up to about two kilometres plus, that sort of thing at the time, which is a pretty sizable distance to be able to fire at. Um, and also this round is so big that if it does hit the target, as you can see there, you're not going to get much left um, after you've been hit by 183 millimetre round. So that, that, that idea, and they're firing at an old uh, early Centurion there, you just see when the impact and what's left afterwards. Um, and that, that idea about what the threat is out there, that's why they're experimenting with this whopping great gun. By the end of the 50s, they can the project in 1957 because actually we're now looking at the idea of missiles being able to do that job for distance. And a little bit later on, of course, we get this famous gun, the L7 105mm, that, to be honest, can almost do what most of this other earlier types of gun can do with new types of natures of ammunition so you know great that we've got it and I always emphasize as well Fam said it as well when I first came here the turret was in our play area yeah I remember uh, yeah. you remember <laughs> surrounded by a bit of muddy water and everything you know you were told what it was it was important that way we had a, a trustee Richard Agorkovitz who was trying to emphasize to us all the time here you know you've got the biggest gun ever that was tested on a, a tank in a direct fire roll it's, I would honestly say as well, it's only because of the interest of the games players that has led us with the opportunities to be able to do more about it. You know, I, I went to a visit to a place called Fort Helsted. They've got the Centurion hull sitting there. So we were able to say, can we have that? And we'll drop this on the top. So that became the gate guard bit. So that worked. And at least we were, you know, saving it that way. But the gaming industry has brought, and obviously World of Tank has brought that level of detail and interest into projects that were sat out the back, have been pretty obscure and everything else, you know, which is, for some people, curator, thank God we saved all this because we can't save everything. We, you know, it's inevitable in the future. We're still going to have to get rid of stuff. But there's an example there of a wow factor vehicle that you guys have helped introduce to everyone. And... We only need a shaving of your audience to show that interest and that support as they have done with raising money etc and that means we can do something else with it so. and you mentioned there about i mean it's very interesting how do you decide i mean a collection on this side you mentioned there about saving which ones you save which yeah. ones you can't through whatever reason i mean how do you go through that thought process together well, I, I would argue that's part of my job significance, but at the same time, it ain't just down to me. So we actually, we, we, we make cases for what we want to acquire and what we think we should dispose of. We've got a collection committee of what I like to think of wise heads, people in the game, people who know their technology, people, you know, so we, we debate that, but it's an, a really interesting, you'll see later on with people like Bruce Crompton and everything, this idea that all the museum sector is under pressure, space, too much stuff, lack of money, all those things. So when we say your hero museum has had to dispose of something, up in arms, you idiots, you've got rid of this, you shouldn't have done that one. The truth is we, we need a debate about it. We need to be honest with people. The world can't save everything. So what is it? How do we concentrate into what does significant mean? What's if you've got three variants? What's the important one? Are your remit for collecting? Is it the one that actually saw action at a battle? You know, or is it for a technical collection, the one that's most complete? Lots of different ways you can do that as an arguing. You're always, you're never going to get it right. Everyone's going to have a different opinion, but someone's got to do it. Otherwise, this place will just be rusty metal and there'll be nowhere for anyone to park. Well, David, thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for the background information on this new and exciting project.
Thank you. Always a, always a joy to spend time with David, of course. Um, and now, again, another joy. I had earlier on a chance to catch up with Chris Van Schardenberg, who's the workshop manager, and he took me on a, a very quick whistle-stop tour around the workshops. So here you are. So I've now popped across the beating heart of the Tank Museum, um, which I'm sure you'll agree with, Chris. Uh, we're here at the workshops, and I'm joined by Chris. Chris, um, maybe you could just give us a quick whistle-stop tour around the workshops, yep. what's been going on, and, and the projects perhaps you're working on at the moment. No problem, Richard. Good to see you again. Yeah, we've done a lot of work on the Valentine in recent years. It's been a bit of a backburner project. Uh, it actually started before COVID, believe it or not. We did a lot of work on the suspension. Our entire suspension was removed, and we had a lot of... Um, new material made for the shock absorbers and the spring sets has literally all gone together earlier this year and as of last week friday we have a track back on it so we're actually welding the track pins back in the two ones that were removed to split the track and then we're gonna um yeah try to it has run already statically but um we're gonna see if it uh, drives again because it has been four or five years out of action now for various reasons but a lot of it was uh, had to do with the suspension work so yeah please did a nice job on it um, and it's finally getting there. So not a total restoration, but a, like a, an overhaul of components and parts. It's looking really nice. I mean, is it easy to get hold of the, the parts for there this? Or? A lot of stuff to make on the suspension uh, units. We got some help from uh, Enduro in New Zealand, who helped us with some seals, but a lot of it we had to remake as well. And yeah, it was sort of a multi-effort between staff, some suppliers, and also some of our volunteers did a great job, especially in recent weeks. A lot of work gone on the um, making, making this fit. And yeah, it's great to see it back together. So it's not a total restoration, but it should safely allow us to uh, operate it again. And uh, a tank dear to my heart. Yes, yeah, one of my favorites as well, the Challenger 1. Uh, it failed during uh, a Tanks in Action display last year, quite spectacularly. It dumped a lot of the oil out of the gearbox and we were worried because we could see the trail going as it left. And luckily the driver, very experienced Roy, had shut it down when he saw the, um, the warning lights coming on. And, but yeah, it was a puddle everywhere. So Sounds like Chieftain, not Challenger. Yeah, so we were worried though. We, we cleaned everything up, of course, to not go, to go everywhere contamination wise, uh, but there was a lot of oil come out of it. We towed it back, um, back in and then we they pulled the engine out a couple of weeks back, um, oil everywhere, washed the whole thing down, cleaned it, and it turned out one of the high pressure lines to the gearbox had split, luckily, so an easy fix. We replaced all the lines, a complete service, oil change, new filters, and it ran again as of last week. They're literally bringing it outside to. Um, we lost some of the, uh, the sprocket ring bolts. Uh, yeah, there's one missing there. So we're just driving it forward um, to um, get us to the correct torque setting and putting new knots on. I think some of the nylon had worn out and they, yeah, we've left, we lost a few. So that's being done. Uh, one of the hydro gas units has to come off because it's losing pressure. And then the others take up too much strain and kindly Horstman supported us uh, a few years back getting new hydro gas units. So we're putting a new one on. And we're just waiting for some tooling to to safely do that. Yeah. Makes me break into a cold sweat, Chris, when you talk about track bashing and everything to do with, with tracks related. <laughs> well, I'm not doing it, but uh, <laughs> no. no. But they seem, it's great to see, they did a fantastic job on this. Great to see it back, uh, because we were worried when we saw this all going everywhere, we thought if this is a major gearbox failure, but it was a relatively um, simple fix, but it allowed us to really clean it up, do the, a full job on the engine, and did a fine job, it really looks good. And it sounds good again, which uh, and it, it first time this morning, actually, it moved out under its own steam again just to do these final repairs. Fantastic. Yeah. Can we have a look inside? Absolutely. So we've now come into the workshops, and um, <laughs> Chris, is this the latest addition to your uh, stock? Well, we want to give you an opportunity to uh, have a bit of a <laughs> driver rehearsal, a bit of refresh. <laughs> now, we've, we've been playing with these mini tanks, as we call them. This is for the, the small kids. It's electric powered on a flat surface. This one actually has its own track and everything, and they were um, basically powered by a lawnmower engine for the arena use. But the problem we have found with them, the problem is the, the concern about fuel and the, the heat with kids and elders driving them with the gas tank there. So we're just modifying one as a bit of a trial with two electric motors, one here and one there to power these individual tracks. So that's ongoing. One of our volunteers, Martin, has been working hard on this to see if we can safely convert one. That is brilliant. I love the suspension on it. I mean, the detail yeah, the on the whole suspension is, there, is fantastic. Uh, proper track and suspension and actually quite good. We, we, as I said, we drove them with the, the, the petrol power, but it was getting a bit too... Uh, con we were getting concerned about the petrol and the heat and fire. Uh, so we're going to modify them and see, see if that works for us. So hopefully we have some of these running next year. Brilliant.
Yeah, a lot of other stuff. Um, uh, the, the Scorpion is in for a service. It has some starting problems, so that's uh, going in for a bit of an adjustment and a service. A 432 behind it. It's been in there for a while waiting for a blower. We had a leaky blower, so it smoked badly, so we're waiting for someone to overhaul the blower before it goes back in. Um, and then the next one is a 5 for 8 on, uh, on stands. That is our, these are our vehicle rides. We have four of those currently running. They did a combined 800 miles this wow. year. Yeah, there's a lot. So they, we always, end of year, take the tracks off, check the suspension, and do a full service on them before because they carry about 11,000 people between them. So they need to be safe and good to use. And as a commercial job we're doing for a client of a chieftain, it's a, it's a gunnery platform, basically. Um, so we did a full service on this um, chieftain hull. It's basically just a chieftain hull without a turret. I recognize this. Yeah, you did the uh, tank shop with William, isn't it? So this um, one of our trustees, actually, he owns several uh, nice tanks. And this is the Chaffee, obviously, um, is on loan to us. Uh, the guys working on them, uh, his team are coming over, I believe, in the next few weeks to um, do some repairs and adjustments on the starter motor and the engines. So we left it in here after the last event. So they're going to work on that. Yeah, it's a beautiful vehicle inside. It's now. amazing, isn't it? The attention to detail that William and his, his team put in them is quite Especially remarkable, considering really. considering this was an actual wreck. So uh, he really enjoyed seeing this being built up again and collecting all the parts for it. And uh, yeah, Gavin at Armored Engineering and his team did a fine job on uh, getting it to where it is. So. Thank heavens for the private collectors. Indeed. And that's the nice balance we managed to do with Kung. Some of our runners, we have about 55 vehicles on, the, on the, the books at the moment running. And some of those are from private collectors. And that allows us to have that fantastic variety. The five variety there, we just talked about. Sorry. Is there any particular t um, vehicle that your team really do not like working on? Is there something which sort of, they, <laughs> they gasp when it breaks down or something goes um, wrong or they have to work on it? Have to ask them, I guess. But um, no, I think what we really enjoy the last, since, since Tiger Day in September, we've actually had a few months of solid working on them. And I think they really enjoy just having the time. Do you know, from April to September, we run so many shows, about 45 running days, plus then 60 days of vehicle rides. You're always rushing around. And what's really nice, you notice the atmosphere that they can actually work on the vehicles and yeah, repair them, service them. And I think that just gives that pride and actually be able to do something. But um, yeah, there's a few awkward ones, but I think everyone, they all have their individual favorites. And, uh, but even something like Five for Eight, we had a real problem with the torsion bar yesterday. And um, sometimes something unexpected happens. You have to sort of learn more about a vehicle that you thought you knew everything about. I think what's always fascinated me about, you know, you certainly your, your team and everything that is, you know, as a tanky, we worked on one particular vehicle. Um, and there, I mean, the expertise that your guys must have to work on such a multitude of vehicles. That's the challenge. You're absolutely right. That's a challenge. We have, um, you know, luckily with the guys we have, but we have so many different vehicles. Yes, there's sometimes commonality on the, the Detroit diesels from a 5 for 8, but the vast majority are different. That's partially, I guess, the attraction for the guys as well. It's, it's never this, all the same. But yeah, it's just uh, sometimes also, that's why I also work with, with private collectors, with individuals, with foreign muse other museums from abroad, uh, military um, collections from abroad, because they have expertise they can, and they're happy to help us. They often come down helping us on vehicles they've been fully trained on and our guys enjoy working with them to learn from them and sort of share that knowledge. So yeah, some other stuff going on, the uh, half track, the M16 half track, uh, the engine failed. Luckily, before it failed, um, we shut it down before it caused any major damage to the engine. But the engine's under here. What actually happened? The crank shaft cracked, which we oh, found wow. out. So Cracky. luckily, uh, it's luckily it didn't go uh, and went like a hand grenade. But we found a new crank um, shaft in the Netherlands, funnily enough, and we're going to strip the engine, clean it down, and send it to an engine rebuild place to have a repaired rather than just put a new engine in it. Leopard is really here because we have completely run out of storage. So. <laughs> oh, so there's nothing wrong with the Leopard at all. Fantastic. Um, German engineering. Uh, well, you know, it had a, it's, it's okay at the moment. Uh, obviously, um, Churchill Mark III belongs to the Churchill Trust. A real and awful lot of work went on it earlier this, this year. We did quite a bit of an engine, not a complete restoration, but an engine overhaul. And the clutch mechanism, which had failed years ago, is now finally all back in one go, uh, one running. And it has done all three events. So it has done um, five event days with no problem wow. at all. So it's now really almost on the bottom. And um, yeah, and we're getting a specialist in next week to 
look with us to make some track guards for it so that it looks externally more complete. But yeah, it's been a, they, they did a fantastic job. Yeah, it was, I think sometimes they wanted to scream some of the stuff was going on, but they were very proud of it when it was then has done. I safely. can imagine it's quite a difficult Season. vehicle to work on. I don't know. Yeah, it just it's appears a very, to me. It's quite complex. There's a lot to it. A lot to it. And, but they enjoyed the challenge of getting that fixed and um, working out what the fault was. Again, it's not a perfect restoration, but it's a, a good mechanical overall. And it, considering it ran the entire season safely and, and very well, uh, um, yeah, very proud what the guys achieved. And I think they, well, they are very proud as well what they managed to do. So, yeah, it's uh, an interesting beast. Uh, and then here, sorry, there's a Valentine bits everywhere because they're slowly putting it together now. <laughs> Although you should be able to recognise those parts over there, Mr. Uh, Cutland. <laughs> what, what are they? Why are they doing over there? They came from uh, Lowworth, <laughs> from the gunnery school. Oh, really? Yeah. It looks like a, yeah, one of those training simulators or something. Uh, yeah. One of the training aids yeah. that we used to Indeed, teach yeah. down on uh, yeah. Lowworth. So we just store it temporarily. And then yeah, the other one that had, uh, obviously this restoration was done quite a few years ago now, but we had continuously problems with um, the gearbox, the pre-selector, and it turns out we had relined it um, with the wrong um, linings material. That was actually relined for us by a friend of ours in the Netherlands with, uh, he does a lot of, uh, Mark van Alden does a lot of pre-selected gearboxes and he helped us with it. And then ever since there was one tweak to do to the reverse, but ever since been perfect. So now it's, it's doing everything it's supposed to do. Bob right. will say it's still not finished. There's always something to There's always do. something to do. But it really <laughs> runs safely now, and, and yeah, goes through the gearbox with no problem. Um, what about sort of going into you know 2024, Chris? Any any big plans? I mean, obviously there is one big one big project big. going on. Um, well, it's always going through. As we just quickly walk around. There's always um, these 55 vehicles. They're never all ready at the same time. So as always within those projects, um, our T34 is hopefully coming in next year that we have been parked up now for years. Uh, we have Sherman Fury needs to get a lot of work in the future because, because of the Sherman is still going, uh, but it's a very tired vehicle. And we're bringing in actually, once Valentine is done, we're bringing our 105 Avery Centurion back in. It has been out of action now for a while. So we're okay. constantly trying to pick up where things have dropped off over the years, trying to bring him back to a standard that we can safely operate in. Because yeah, we're actually building a meteor engine in there for the, um, I can show you if you want, for the, um, <clears throat> for the um, Centurion. Oh, wow. So this is our first attempt at, um, if you lift it outside, um, of building a meteor. It's obviously upside down at the moment. Um, it's done by one of our volunteers, wow. Les. Um, and we're just gathering all sorts of information and parts we have two or three of these engine as takeouts, and we're keen to see uh, if we can do one ourselves. Yes, we have stored motors, but there's also, you'd notice a challenge, the guys want to see if they can do it themselves and make it happen. So yeah, lots going on, but specifically from that fleet um, of vehicles, and obviously apart from the one that you, uh, that we'll mention. Yeah, the FE 4005, yeah. of course, and we're going to be talking obviously a lot more about that, but um, brilliant. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, all I can say from all of us is thank you for all the work you do. Um, I mean, you know, I think everybody appreciates how hard it can be to keep such an amazing amount of a variety of vehicles on the road all the time. No, thank you and thank you. Good to see you again and thanks for your support. Well, that was a really fascinating insight to the work that goes on in the Tank Museum workshop. And we're joined here now by Chris Van Schoenberg, the head of collections, but also another special guest who's joining us here all the way from Leicestershire. That's uh, Mr. Joe Hughes, who is, of course, the, the, uh, owns the organization that's responsible for the work on the FV 4005. So, Joe, thank you very much for joining us this evening. No problem. So, yeah, tell us, what on earth made you want to get stuck into the FV 4005 <laughs> project? Well. We restore tanks, that's something that's an odd conversation in its own, but we've started restoring tanks and in the winter it's cold and we want to knock off early for a cup of tea and we sort of got into the routine of just coming home, playing World of Tanks and it uh, seemed sort of relevant to what we were doing. So uh, we were playing the game and constantly, you know, we're getting knocked out by this massive, massive tank and obviously a friend of mine said that, that plays it, knows all about it, he said, was explaining what the vehicle is. and. Uh, over a couple of weeks i said well it'd be really cool if we could build that because there isn't there isn't one in existence and i actually have a mark three hull or the company uh, has one and i thought well it's a good idea because you know we've got the right chassis whereas the one obviously at the tank museum is on the wrong chassis it's the mark 12. so 
basically, I knew Chris, and I messaged him one, one evening. I said, can I come and take some measurements of the hull? You know, and I'd like to try and re-engineer re my own, sorry, not the hull, the, the turret. I'd like to try and uh, make my own turret and basically build the vehicle. And uh, his response was, what on earth do you want to do that for? <laughs> um, but anyway, we, we, I explained the relevance of the game and that how it, you know, obviously I like Centurions because it's the first tank actually I ever really restored. So I like them anyway. And obviously this one's really different because it's the only one in existence. So that's how it's I think we've out. got some footage of you working on the Centurion as well. Mm -hmm. So and the, yeah, some brilliant footage here, Joe. I mean, in particular, maybe you want to talk <laughs> us through this. <laughs> yeah, I quite like these parts. Obviously, this is, this is the new engine that I'm hoping to, to fit in it. So this is just trial running it for the first time. And Brand new engine? Well, it, it's a recon. This hasn't run since, uh, well, for, for 30 years, this has been in storage. It's actually, it's actually been in my front room, in my living room. <laughs> I'm a little bit weird. Why not? <laughs> um, and I think this was a third attempt to get it started. And, and to be fair, she ran really, really well. Um, but it's, it's like a key part of the, the start of the build and quite an exciting part. So what kind of challenges are you facing with this particular project? Well, everything's very heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and everything takes a lot more time than every, you know, every aspect takes quite a lot of time. So it's, it's nice to, to get things like that, which obviously the engine's a fairly major part. Mm -hmm. So to have that checked off the list that, okay, it's a big project, but the engine is okay, so we can, we can put that to one side. Um, but no, it, it, I've actually done a few now. So to me, I'm just actually excited about getting it ready for Tank Fest. It's not so much a... Of if it will be ready, I'm pretty confident our team will be able to make sure it is. And I think it'll be a lot of fun on the way. It'll be a fantastic sight to see it going around the arena. <laughs> that would be place. brilliant. It'd just be bizarre, won't it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the monstrosity rumbling around that arena is yeah. going to be something to behold. Joe, how did you, I mean, obviously a lot of people know you through TikTok, YouTube. I mean, how did you get into that side of it to start with then? <sighs> it's funny. I've always posted stuff online, mainly Instagram. I started on that and I don't know why. I was well, I always like editing videos and just trying to make them funny. And obviously I'm generally working around unusual vehicles. So people tend to, you know, watch what I was doing if it was daft or whatever. And it's just spiraled out of control from there really. And then I started TikTok um, last year or the year before and that seemed to do quite well in the tank. You know, we generally do tanks and restoring them. And then I thought, well, we'll try YouTube. and. Uh, I actually ended up selling a vehicle to quite a popular YouTuber in the States and that was an experience. I learned a lot from him and he did a lot with his chief. I'm sure a lot of people have seen. Um, so yeah, it, it's just exciting. There's so much going on and, you know, it's now become, you know, my full time it never stops. You know, we're always doing something. So. And Chris, obviously, I mean, he's bringing Chris to the conversation mm. here. So we've heard some <laughs> Joe's side for the, the, the restoration process. But I mean, really, for the museum, what was it that appealed to this about this? Um, well, we have, um, as, as Joe said, we met, we've met a few times. And then it was in January it was, he said, can we have a look at this thing? And it was a bit like, why? Uh, <laughs> but then uh, they said, well, I want to copy this. OK. And like most things, once someone points out a project, you actually start looking into it. And then actually I realized, hey, this thing shouldn't be sitting out here. You're so used to it sitting out there, just rotting away. And I knew it, of course, it was on a later hull. And look a bit more into it through Joe's enthusiasm, really. And I thought it would be a bit sort of uh, selfish if we have, as the Tank Museum, have this thing continue to rot outside when there's maybe a project we can do together. Uh, we spoke sort of informally. I said, hey, is this thing big in the game? You said yes. <laughs> and then we said, OK, let's, let's go. And then we sort of came up with a plan. And then, uh, yeah, just the enthusiasm that, that Joe and the guys had about it. And we were thinking, well, we, there's a win-win here. We can do something together. Because, yeah, that thing shouldn't have been sitting out there for so long. And now, finally, um, we didn't know what to do with it short term. We were just going to pull it off the plinth because the, the hole started to rot so badly. And this was like, yeah, we can do something here. A great opportunity. Thanks again to when you said we may be able to support this. And they got all excited about it. We've got a project, and that's good. And, yeah, we all got very excited about it. But then for us, the season took off because he was like, Pessy, when can we have some sort of a deal? And I have to keep postponing it. And thank you for hanging in there because um, only in the recent weeks have we actually finally signed some agreements because, yeah, we're just so busy this year. But it was, um, 
Yeah, now you have the full six months to do it. So yeah. what's, what's no, possibly no, go no wrong? Worries. No stress. <laughs> no stress. <laughs> no, but, but thank you for hanging in there and, uh, and for your enthusiasm. It was your idea. And uh, I want to make that very clear. Without you, it wouldn't have gotten that. and your support. Uh, I think really, where we are. it wouldn't be happening if it weren't for World of Tanks, really. That's yeah. what inspired my enthusiasm mainly. So it'd be exciting. Yep. But Chris, it's only a cosmetic restoration, isn't it, really? We're not putting it all back internally? Or how far are we going um, to go with this one? Yeah, of course, as we know, the, the, as you said before, and as David said, it's only the turret that's the, the, the original to that project. It is on a later hull, and that's what obviously Joe mentioned. They have an earlier hull, which would be more correct. But interestingly enough, we have a lot of the drawings um, in the archive. So when, when we first started talking about it, I went to our colleague Jonathan in the archive. I said, Jonathan, can I have a look what we actually have? Turns out we have a lot of the, the drawings for those unique items like the, um, the recoil plow, the gun cradle, uh, which is fantastic. So he dug those out. Uh, yesterday we had uh, a visitor, Adrian Beryl, who does a lot of sort of fantastic um, work for making bins and, and components for tank restorations around the country and around Europe, really. Um, he came to, to look at these drawings with us to, to have these manufactured so they can be added to um, Joe's Mark III hull and make this into a correct recreation with the correct turret, original turret, um, um, of a 4705, yeah. I have to say, Chris, when you see the video there, I mean, and I've been up close to this, um, the turret is a mess, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a massive box, obviously. I don't think they actually call it a turret, don't they? what do they call it, a gun house or something? <laughs> Uh, and in there, it's it's quite empty. Yeah. Not all the components are there, but it's still recognizable. The, the, the original footage that you showed earlier that we looked at as well, a lot of those fittings are still there, but some parts are missing, but it's in rough condition. So we're actually going to strip the, take the turret out. Uh, there sorry, we go. We can see it quite out. clearly there, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, yeah, it's rough. Because it's been outside for 50 years. And mm. I think that's the other thing. If we wouldn't have done it now, mm. in another it's five to hard. 10 years, you get to a point of what they have left. So we're going to take the, the, the top plate off the front plate or to lift the gun out. That's how you're actually supposed to lift it off because you're not supposed to lift it by the turret eyes because of the sheer weight. Then we're going to take the, uh, the turret um, or the, the gun house out, blast everything after we have removed the remaining fittings and then see if there's any structural elements where the gun sits on. There's some big beams to make sure they're not structurally, through corrosion, weakened. And then we're going to prime it and send the whole thing uh, to Joe. So self-assembly required and uh, see a tank fest. Well, it's pretty exciting though, isn't it? You know, the, the level of support we've been able to garner for this project. Do you think we'll be able to try similar things like this in the future? You know, crowdfunding, restoration projects, that sort of I thing? I hope so, yes. I hope so. This is a good, as we said earlier, we have a big fleet to maintain and a museum to operate mm -hmm. and conservation projects to do as well. And we're always collecting and dealing and in, in vehicle, or dealing, uh, collecting vehicles and managing that, that both that museum collection and running collection so I think we need to look to external partners and working with external groups like Joe and his colleagues and uh, yeah, with you in the, the fundraising um, element of because there's some exciting projects that we currently don't have as a priority and that we can't do at the moment ourselves with the resources we have. So I think that's we need to work in the wider sector, which we are, this is in a way a trial, a trial to do so. And Joe, what's kind of next? What are the next big tasks to complete on the project? So for me, I'm obviously working on the lower hull, trying to get that up to a running driving condition, ready for when you've got your half ready for it. Um, Possibly so <laughs> we're currently, we, we've stripped the hull down. We've still got the tracks on, so it's just rollable. Uh, the tracks that are currently on the hull are actually uh, rubber tracks known as hush puppies on a Centurion. They're obviously incorrect for the application, so we're gonna have to swap them for steels. Um, but basically, we're at the stage now where the hull is basically bare, so we're gonna give it a thorough cleaning and then we'll be uh, blasting the hull and then painting it basically. And then we will start piecing all the nice shiny bits together. Excellent. And people can keep track of the progress on your YouTube channel, which yeah. is? My, my channel is called Mr. Hughes. Um, everything on, that I do social is that, it's all the same. But yes, yeah, so I'll be keeping a, a vlog basically of as and when and how we do it. And you know, you can actually watch it being built in real time almost. So uh, I suppose the big question for, for, for everybody is, is it going to be ready for Tank Fest 24? <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty confident it is. Am I tempting fate? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm confident it is. Should I want it to be reliable. Control version of it ready, just yeah. in case. Maybe, <laughs> maybe ne the year after, maybe remote control. But um, no, I'm, I'm pretty confident. The good thing about Centurion is they were a very good tank anyway. The parts are fairly, relatively available. 
can't get my words out. Yeah. Quite. We've got plenty of parts, basically, <laughs> which other tanks you'd struggle with. So we've got a lot of things on our side, um, but we've actually got everything we need. So it's more just a case now of just knuckling down and doing the graft and putting it all together. Now I'm going to steal a bit of Nick's time here where I know it's very popular in game this tank as Joe mentioned he was on the receiving end of it many many times where it's a tank that is by all means the biggest gun on a direct fire part of it and as many of you know you can take part in a fundraiser to be able to get your name on that vehicle Nick is going to go into that shortly but it's a tank that yeah it's in the game it's a very unique play style that involves if you make a mistake and it's on the other enemy team you don't get much forgiveness involved it's kind of like oh welcome and back to your garage uh, it does reverse pretty slow though and as mentioned the armor is pretty thin on the turret so you will get punished if you do peek out a little bit but yeah uh, i know many people are fascinated and really looking forward to this from the community so if you'd like nick to go through some of the the fundraiser of how people can maybe get their name on the tank it's got a great nickname as well of course oh yes, yes. perhaps we won't cover that here but yeah once <laughs> we again thank you very much to everyone who supported the uh, the project so far including world of tanks and and, and you joe as well um, if you'd still like to support us you can go to tankmuseum.org forward slash fv4005 and for a donation of 50 pounds you will get your name on one of the panels on the back of that tank and that will be there for all to see as hopefully the fv4005 <laughs> goes around the arena at tank fest but also i think it'll be attending other shows around the country as well that's the hope in the future perhaps joe yeah i think really we want the public to see it as often as we can um because i think it's going to be a very unusual to think you know no, no other tank show is going to have something like this mm -hmm. you know and, and it'll also bring in a younger audience maybe that probably aren't so interested in the earlier things yeah. so yeah, yeah. It, it'll be a di different thing at the shows this year i think no plans to start in your living room for a couple of months i was going to start the engine in the living room okay he had, my, the, he had the engine in his living room but my girlfriend was very yeah. against that you could Sorry. move into the turret i reckon it's big yeah. enough i could have probably run the engine up in the turret there's yeah. that yeah. much room yeah 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 but Certainly uh, one of the weirdest vehicles I think we've ever restored to uh, running condition. Yeah, but I think that's the beauty of it, isn't it? Mm. And it'll be fantastic to see it at Tankfest. Get your tickets now. Brilliant. Um, Joe, thank you so much for, for coming along and telling us all about that. Chris, obviously, for everything you do as well. Um, don't forget, of course, to check out all Joe's channels. They are absolutely fantastic. Um, plug for you there, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, so you're welcome. <laughs> um, and what we're going to do now is... Uh, it was an absolute joy. A couple of weeks ago, I travelled all the way up to North Yorkshire and I caught up with the Eden Camp Museum. Hello everyone, my name is Frank Wood. I'm Head of Site and Restorations here at Eden Camp Museum based in North Yorkshire. I'm here today to tell you a little bit more about what we do, what this unique, wonderful place was all the way from 1941 all the way to present day. We've now brought you to the centre of Eden Camp. This is the prison proper. These buildings were erected in 1941 by the Italian prisoners of war that were captured by the Brits in Northern Africa. These buildings are unique. They're the, basically the last survivors of its kind. They were made of something called Nashcrete, and they were essentially the prison for the guys. That's where they had to stay. This is where our prisoners were kept. They were kept in bunks of 64 men, and they would have had a footlocker at the end of their beds for their own personal belongings. They would have worked on farms during the day under very light guard because they were a very low level enemy. And then after that, they had free time and in free time, they would have crafted stuff like trinkets and other ornaments, ready for trade for cigarettes and the same. Inside our unique buildings is our museum. We try very hard to transport our visitors back in time. We use the sights, the sounds and the smells, and we hope that you can really engage with what we're showing you. Just behind me is the Blitz Hut, it's one of our new experiences. We basically make you walk through what was the start of a lovely sunny day and the night of which was not so nice, was not so sunny. It was the start of the blitz. We show you the bomb and the bomb damage, the dropping of bombs and the casualties of war. We're now going to talk about Hut 25, which is our newest visitor experience. It's our human torpedoes display. It's where we keep our very special collection of very rare human torpedoes. And they are exactly as they would sound. They are a torpedo that is manned by a human, of course, and they were expected to pilot these warheads into a dock underneath a battleship 
affix the warhead with magnetic clamps and then escape on the carrier. A fair risky business at best. Here at Eden Camp, we don't just focus on military history, we also work hard to show you what happened to the real person in World War II, to the civilians and how life was back in the 1940s. Behind me just here, we have our Heritage Hall. This is the area where we take our visitors to our family run museum and we try to explain using tanks and facts a little bit about how tanks work and how we use them in the field. Eden Camp Heritage Restorations was formed in 2019. We work very hard to make sure that we restore in a probably a different manner to a lot of people. We're very keen on accuracy and the story behind the vehicle. We have a lovely M50 Sherman the big blue one, as most of you might recognise. And we've also got some wonderful Falkland CVRT. Directly behind me, we have the M16 half track. This vehicle was built in the USA in 1943, and it went through World War II with US forces. We use the sights, the sounds, and the smells at Eden Camp to make sure our visitors are transported back in time, and we'd like to show you this working properly. This vehicle was used as an anti-aircraft weapon in the very first instance. Its turret is armed with four 50 cal machine guns that can fire vertically. The rate of fire, as you would expect, is quite high. What happened after the war is we realized that the ceiling of the guns wasn't very high, and planes could simply fly above them. What we did instead was we put another ring under the turret, and that allowed the gun to be depressed, which basically gave it a horrible name, which was called the Meat Chopper. Welcome to the Heritage Hall. This is where our museum really comes to life. We use these vehicles here that you can see behind me. We run them to make sure that you can see them moving, you can listen to them and you can smell them. We have vehicles in the hall ranging from 1908 all the way to present day. 1985 is our last one. We use these guys to speak to you about the war, our wars rightly. We cover World War I history, we cover World War II history, and we cover much more recent conflict as well. We are looking forward to this year, 2024, because it's the anniversary and we're going to be using our World War I truck, our J2 auto car, to really engage our visitors. So here at Eden Camp, we are going to undertake probably our most difficult restoration. We're going to be working on the Churchill Mark 7 Crocodile just behind me there. It is a flamethrower tank from World War II. It's used by the Brits and it's probably gonna be a fairly difficult restoration in the fact that it's got no gearbox. It's also got no brakes at that rate and it's probably not got a very good engine. The engine's been outside 30 years. This vehicle was recovered from Pound Scrapyard sometime around 1958. We hope that you'll come back and you'll see us with it running, but really at this time and place, we would love to ask Santa Claus to bring us a nice, shiny new Bedford 12-cylinder engine, and then we could run this thing about for everybody. From everyone here at Eden Camp Museum, we'd like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. We look forward to seeing you all in 2024. If you want to come and visit our museum, it is a great award-winning day out for families all the way from five years old to 50 years old. Everyone's welcome. Everyone will get something out of it. You can find us on Facebook, or by all means, visit our website, www.edencamp.co.uk. A uh, massive thank you to Eden Camp Modern History Museum. Frank there, as I say, the hospitality we were showing when we went up there was remarkable. And again, if you're ever in that neck of the woods, I can't emphasise enough what a great day out is. Now we're fortunate to be joined by another special guest. Uh, how do you explain him? TV celebrity, collector, historian. You're certainly a great friend of the Tank Museum and it's great to have you here, uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Bruce Crompton. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here as normal. Obviously, you know, I'm a big supporter of this establishment here. Uh, and for me, coming down and doing this to obviously raise profile, absolutely no problem at all. Oh, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Now, Bruce, I mean, Obviously, you're always welcome. Now, yeah. one of the main reasons you're here, of course, is, is to talk about this exciting new project of yours. So, we've got, you've, we've got a thing called Amazing More Stories. It's a podcast. Now, what I've done, based away from my TV career, although watch this space with what we're doing now, Amazing <laughs> More Stories has been set up to support museums and the artefacts they've got housed in them and support veterans. Now, I'm, you know, I'm getting on a bit now, but I'm the flag waver for trying. A lot of museums in this country are in trouble this fight is fine and we all work together we're going to help and the message i put across every time is support your museums but in all fairness amazing war story is taken off 
unbelievably. Uh, and I'm proud to be involved in it, really proud to be involved in it. Now, am I right in saying, Bruce, that it is actually sitting at number one? Yep in the Apple charts at yep. the moment? Yeah, for obviously history. If it was top of the pops, I'd be there. Don't worry about it. I'd be there. No, it really is. And the latest one that we came out yesterday was, uh, um, we've done obviously something that's tied into you down here. So we've done War Daddy, the real story of Fury, because obviously it's based on a real character. And with the help of David and yourselves down here, we're promoting your museum down here because you've got the artefacts that went with the film. And as you know, I was heavily involved with the film, mm -hmm. uh, very good friend with David Ayres, and based on that, we delved into the history and War Daddy was a real person. He was the highest scoring tank commander for the Americans in the Second World War. His name was Lafayette Paul. Uh, he survived the war with terrible injuries, but the whole podcast is incredible because we use immersive 3D sound which nobody does. So when you hear a Sherman in it or a Lancaster, it really is that sound. And I'm proud to say I'm very proud of them because each episode comes from a museum. The, normally the curators are all involved in it or we've got celebrities involved. And we tell the story of an actual hero or something that happened from a museum. It's all double checked by Dr. Chris Mann, so our facts are right. But I'm very proud of where we are with these things. What are some of the other stories that you've covered that have been really resonated well with the oh, audience? Oh, really? I mean, we started off We started off by doing the first one we did was called A for Apple. It's funny because it's about a Lancaster that crashed a mile from my house. Unbelievable story, unbelievable. And that was the first one we did. But then we went on to others. We did about the assassination of, the tried assassination of Rommel. We did, the, the, one of the best ones we did was the Commandos, the Grinch Christmas. It's about commando raid in Northern uh, uh, Norway. Now that was a Christmas special. Mm. We've got uh, celebrities in it, Jason Fox. We've got um, a game, Phil Campion. So we have celebrities in all of these. But all the stories are true. And after I tell the story, my message is, Go and support your local museum. Um, I've got to tell you here, we're losing museums one a month. Mm. You know, we've got a fantastic website now. You can punch your postcode in, it'll tell you where every museum is, when they're open, etc., etc. And of course, the website to bring you right up to date mm. with what we're doing. And the website is for the. The website is <coughs> amazingwarstories.com. Amazing and you can look at that. Honestly, we've got a lot of stuff. We're starting to do artifact pages. And places like yourself have got a full page showing what you do, what your events are, and we're taking that out. I mean, we're doing a lot with Hendon, uh, National Army Museum. Obviously, support our paras. That's my, you know, my <laughs> of little course, thing, of right? Course. <laughs> um, so, and a lot of the other museums. Mm. I'm trying to get around to everybody because they need our support. Honestly, you know, I, I love coming down here. You know, I've been coming down here for years, what I do, but I'm just now very passionate about what I'm trying to do to preserve mm. our heritage, which is in museums. And as a result of that, we support our veterans, you know, and I'm proud to be able to do it. And you've obviously been great. Your people have been great. Everybody down here. I know this chap for a long time, you know. <laughs> I've been out for a couple of drinks in Prague with him, so I won't go into My that. My goodness me, that's yeah, yeah. enough of that. Yeah, yeah. Of another story, maybe an entire podcast. No, so so it's Amazing War Stories is the podcast, so go to Apple, go yeah, to Spotify, it's on everything. Amazing War yeah, Stories. Um, there we go, look, I've actually got a card, amazingwarstories.com, <laughs> there you go. But please have a listen, it's all free, there's no charge, everything is free. It's all been, I, I won't go into it, but it, it's cost a lot of money, but it's free because we're trying to protect our heritage and look after our veterans. Uh, and that's my mission in life now, as you say. Brilliant. You know? You know? But, you know, I still get a bit of it. Don't worry about that. I was going to say, Bruce, so outside of the podcast, I can't imagine you've got a lot of free time at the moment. No. How, how is your collection? Yeah, you great. We're boys are big because, you know, I've got two teams, one in Leicester, one in uh, one down in uh, uh, my house. At the moment, my big thing at the moment, I acquired an original bouncing bomb. 18 months ago, one of only five originals left. Mine. Sounds dangerous. So it's, it's empty. <laughs> Don't, there's no £6,600 at all, Bex, in it. But um, I then got a David Brown tractor. My boys have done that. That's done. The trailer's being done now. I'm working with Hendon and East Kirby on that. So I knew Johnny Johnson well, um, the, the last stand bus. I've become a good friend of his. I used to go down and see him in his care home. And out of respect to him, I want to do that. But then the boys have got half tracks they're doing. And there's a potential big 
project about to come up. I don't want to tell them because they're getting on a bit. So, but we, we've got loads going on. We ain't got a minute to spare, mate. We really haven't got a minute to spare. I can so. see on the screen there, we're looking at some pictures of uh, Hetzer. That's the Hetzer. Now that Hetzer, the full history of that, it's, it's one of the only, there are only four Hetzers early like that with the early uh, Salkoff blender uh, visors. This one was, um, it was produced in July 1944. It was sent to a training unit, but then in January 45, it was seconded to the Gross Deutschland division. And it went and fought in a place called Clockenburg. Mm. And it was knocked out by the Hampshire regiment and buried in a hole, dug up in 1980. It's absolutely perfect. We've redone, we wanted to take it back to the day it came out the factory. That's why the colour is why it is. That's the colour it came out the factory. Um, and again, it's, it's just, you know, obviously we've done the Panther, we've done the Shermans, mm. we've done all kinds of bits and pieces. The thing about that is, people say, oh, Panthers and Shermans, they're massive, they're a nightmare. This thing's quite a bit of fun. I mean, you can't, <laughs> you can't go down a pub in it, but believe me, I can drive Turn it around. a few around. heads, though. Yeah, it? yeah, it is. <laughs> and obviously we've displayed it down here for you at Tank mm, Fest. It's a pleasure right, yeah. to do that as well. You've got a beautiful example here. That's... One of the, it's the 10th one made at the Skoda Works in 1944. Your one is a very late war one. I'm not sure if it's BMM or, or Skoda, but it's something we enjoy doing. We're doing some allied vehicles at the moment, as I say, the RF bits and pieces. Uh, uh, we've got another um, Jeep that I'm doing because I do a, an article for classic military vehicles where this month, we promoted the cat and crowd I did mm. for you. Yeah. And we told the story of that. And again, even in the articles, go to your museums. Yeah. Go to your museums. You know, if you don't know where they are, look at our website or sign up to our newsletter. It's all there and it's growing day by day. I mean, I'm being pulled from pillar to post. I think it's because I'm good looking. But, uh, you know, <laughs> Still got my, it, my mission, honestly, <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, I'm heavily involved with different regiments and I'm the ambassador for the Parachute Regiment Airborne Assault Museum. Um, and it, you know, but they need, some of them need help. So I'm proud to be able to do it, you know. So you're a regular visitor here to the Tank Museum. Yep. Do you remember your first visit? Yes, I came down here, we were on holiday and as happened, where it rains, where do you go, you know? And it was one of them, I came here with my father and uh, I must have been about 11 years old. And of course, I'm only 21 now, so it's a few years ago. <laughs> I was 67 nearly, but anyway, no, I do and I remember it. I can't tell you why I remember it because your old buildings there mm. was all, it was like a shed, you know, and you had all lovely stuff in there. And I've been passionate about what you've done down here. I really have. And as you know, I, you know, anything I do for you down here, whatever restoration, I'm only happy to do that. You know, it's part of what we do. Have you got a favourite tank? Me, I've got to be honest here. Uh, yes, I have. Um, although I did your top five tanks and you your did? bottom five tanks, right? Um, but I still like the Centurion. I, yeah. I think it's a fantastic tank. So, um, or to upset, um, what's his name, uh, Bill, um, uh, what's the comedian's name? I do still like the Panther as well, because mm -hmm. we've done a Panther. <laughs> and yours, the late war one, and that was the pinnacle of what they did. You know, they really got it right by then. But listen, if you want to help museums, get on the, get on the web, amazingwarstories.com. Sign up to the website. There's loads of stuff on their stories. And anybody that's got interesting stories about their family or whatever, I'm keen to hear about it because we're looking at the next production of mm. them for the new year. Sounds great. So if you've got any great stories, amazingwarstories.com, is it? That's it, amazingwarstories.com. Drop an email. Yeah, drop an email and I'll be happy to hear from anybody. So, Bruce, uh, what would you say, you know, you're a collector, what's the most unusual item you've got in your collection, would you say? I've been getting a lot of stuff. We're building an extension to my museum at the mm -hmm. moment. And, um, you, know, I've, you know, I've got something recently that was fantastic. So I've got a tin and in it was a watch, a, a pilot's watch, from a glider pilot that was shot down at Arnhem, well, Captain Arnhem, and he'd engraved it all with his name on the top. And when I opened it, there were all these personal effects and there, there was this watch. And it's those sort of items with that history. You know, every item, if you know the history about it, you've got to preserve it. Because once it's gone, it's gone. And it's little items like that, or certain vehicles. That Hetzer, I know so much about it. I've got the divisional records of the Gross Deutschen, the Hampshire Ready, and you can read and, mm. you can, and you can bring it back to life. Listen, I'm only a custodian. One day, hopefully, my stuff will be in a museum or whatever, um, but I'm proud to be able to do it. I mean, we do Allied stuff, we do German stuff, 
Um, but I'm proud of the guys. My guys, I've got to tell you, mate, I can't wire a plug. I mean, <laughs> they're like doctors. I'm not sure you should let them out. I mean, there's Bruce two there. Look, there's another <laughs> half track we've just done there. That's just finished. That's beautiful. That's a pioneer. It's got everything in it, all the explosives, everything. It's got bridges on it. That's just been finished. <clears throat> uh, we're about to do another one, which is a mortar version. Uh, there's not one of those about. And I'm chasing a couple of things. Uh, I just don't tell my wife. You know, <laughs> I really don't. I keep telling, I and mean, we did the show, and, you know, I, I, I got me, uh, me first uh, Cuba wagon, I said to my wife, I bought you a lovely soft top. She thought she was getting a lovely Mercedes, and I pulled up in there, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's just great fun doing this stuff. We have a lot of fun with, you know, we do artillery and all, but it's all about having the history behind this stuff. And we tell this history. Let me tell you, in Amazing War Stories, the first thing I'll say before you listen is, Everything you're about to hear is 100% true. How mad, no matter how mad it sounds, these stories are incredible. The Lancaster story, the lightning strikes we're about to do about B-17, you can't, you think it's untrue. It couldn't happen, but it did, it's all true. And as I say, everything we do is, you know, it's directed towards getting people to museums. You know, we've done some crackers, they've gone down very well, and I'm gonna carry on doing them. You know, it's, for me, it's great. Well, Bruce, thank you very much for joining us down here. It's I know you've come down here especially just yeah, to see yeah, us. Yeah, of course I can, really mate. Of course I really can. Really grateful. Of course I can. Do check out the podcast, Amazing War Stories. And our next video, we are going to be looking at some of the more unusual items in the Tank Museum's collection. Thank you very much. All done. We're now over in the Vehicle Conservation Centre, and I have to say it's one of my favourite places in the whole museum. And I'm joined by Chris Copson to talk about perhaps some of those more unusual tanks that you find down here in the museum. Chris Panard. Right, so we're starting off with a small vehicle with a really big gun. This is the French Panard EBR armoured car. It's a reconnaissance vehicle, but it has got a 75mm gun. It's effectively a tank-sized gun in a very small vehicle. The reason they're able to do that is something called an oscillating turret. Now, if you look at the turret, it's in two parts. Uh, there's the actual turret ring, and then sitting on top of that, there's an independently moving top half. So the breech is way back there. It's a peculiar vehicle in lots of ways. It's got a crew of four. So you've got a commander and a gunner. There's no loader, because it's got an auto loader. But then it's got two drivers, one at the front, one at the back. Essence of a recce vehicle is to be able to get in and get out quickly. If you're in a reconnaissance vehicle and you've got rounds clanging off the outside, you're making a mistake. The other unusual thing about it is it's eight by eight. So you've got conventional wheels front and back, and then in the middle, there are two pairs of aluminium wheels with steel treads. Those can be raised or lowered, but they give the vehicle superb cross-country mobility. Now, David, a vehicle that I'm sure many people perhaps have never even heard of, small, perfectly formed and Italian. Yeah, this is the uh, Caro Veloce or light tank that the Italians built in the 1930. Basically, it's a copy of a British idea, the tankette. You make small, either one or two man light vehicles. And the real aim here is you're learning how to use armor. Um, yes, they have armor protection. This version has a flamethrower carries behind it a trailer that's got pressurized fuel in, pumped through, ignited at the end. So it does have a use in warfare, but for most countries getting these light tankettes, it's a way of then learning the art of armored warfare. Because don't forget, 20s and 30s, not much tank warfare has taken place yet. We're only learning lessons from the First World War. So not that successful in World War II, but in the 30s, the Italians are using this against Abyssinians, and most of those only have a rifle. They're lucky if they've got maybe a bit of artillery. So, usual story, if you don't have any tank, you want something, and any tank is better than no tank at all. So, Chris, you've brought us along now to what I may say is a rather tired-looking chieftain. What makes this so special, then? Yeah, this poor old thing's been um, out in the weather a bit. But this is a unique vehicle. This is the chieftain Crazy Horse. This is effectively the biggest radio-controlled toy you will ever come across. What it was, you can see the gun's been taken out, um, it was designed as a mobile hard target for anti-tank guided weapons. It's ripped out inside, there's a hydraulic steering system, 
radio control kit and it was all steered from a Stormer vehicle. It didn't work very well. It was far too expensive for its use. And the other thing about it is the hot rumour was that it used to go its own way a little bit. <laughs> so the idea of 60 odd tonnes of Chieftain making its own way across Salisbury Plain didn't really bear thinking about, so the project was dropped. So Chris, very unusual, uh, a Chieftain, but not as we know it. This is the Chieftain SID, which is the Chieftain Signature Integration Demonstrator. And putting it in very simple terms, this is how you make a stealth tank. We're all familiar with stealth aircraft, but this is trying to make something stealthy that weighs 64 tonnes, it's appallingly noisy, and it chucks out 40 foot exhaust plume. So what they've done to begin with is to reprofile the hull and the turret. It's also covered with black anechoic paint. You've got bushes on the tracks, front and rear, and the wheels themselves are screened off. And it's all about limiting the thermal acoustic and radar signature. Now, this was actually designed as a test bed for anti-tank guided weapon systems, and it was remarkably effective. It completely confused the guidance systems. We didn't take it any further. It's not a very practical vehicle, but elements of it, such as the shape of the turret, the way that the stowage is actually built in, were carried on into Challenger 1. So continuing our theme of the weird, wonderful, and wacky, we're now joined by the man himself, Mr. David Willey. David. Yeah, so why we think this is an oddity? Obviously, it's not a tank. It's a mobile, wire-controlled bomb. And of course, today we call it a UGV, unmanned ground vehicle. So from that point of view, the idea of not risking a person is quite an old idea. It goes back, even the First World War, the French had a go, land torpedoes. The Germans captured a French idea. It was a prototype by someone called Alphonse Cagres. They dug it, the Frenchman threw it in the Seine when the Germans were coming in 1940. They retrieved it, gave it to the Borgvold company, and they ended up building a very similar idea. Tracks, it was going to have an electric motor, two electric motors. First models have the electric motor. They then realized copper's in short supply, etc. They put a petrol engine in there for the second model. And it is used. They make over about 7,000 of the two models. Not that successful when you consider the time, the energy, everything that goes into it. But of course, you only need it to work once or twice with pretty alarming results, you know, an awful lot of explosive in this. So they like the idea. And actually in the collection, we've got two other mobile bombs that the Germans made before the end of the war. So a bit of an oddity but an idea we keep coming back to when we don't want to risk soldiers' lives. So David, uh, a tank that's air transportable, not something we really think of very often. Yeah, again, militaries have to think of where possibly might we be fighting. 1930s, the Russians looked at the idea of can you transport a tank on the belly of an aircraft? They even tried some light tanks, giving them wings and making them sort of air portable that way. Second World War, use of airborne forces, the Americans issue a requirement for a light tank. This is what they build, the M22, it's called the Locust. The irony is they don't have a plane or a glider big enough to actually transport it by air. British do, we have the Hamilcar glider, so we use these for the Rhine crossing in the spring of 1945. It's the only action they actually see. Armour plate to stop a bullet, not much else. 37 millimeter gun, so it's the same gun that would be on a Stuart light tank. So it has some power there, um, but it was really there, a bit of moral support for the airborne troops in the early parts of a landing. Um, you are not going to be that effective if you're going up against contemporary German tanks at the time, but that's not really its idea. So uh, a bit of a rarity. What a dinky size. It looks absolutely lovely, doesn't it? The sort of thing you want to play in the garden. Fantastic. So Chris, one of my all-time favourite tanks, Matilda II, but very unusual configuration. This is another of our real weird and wonderfuls. As you said, the hull is a Matilda II, but they've taken the turret off, uh, so the two-pounder gun's gone, and they've replaced it with this box. And inside that is a 13 million candle power arc light, uh, and it's called the Matilda CDL, Canal Defence Light. That doesn't seem to mean anything at all. What it was designed to do was to blind an enemy, because not only is it 13 million candle power, it also flickers, it oscillates. So that's going to close your eyes down for you. The bad news is they weren't really used. Crews are up at Lowther Castle near Penrith, 
spent three years training with these things. A few went to Egypt. Half a dozen were used uh, during the Rhine crossings. But other than that, it was just an invention they couldn't find a use for. Pretty typical of wartime, really, when you think about it. Absolutely. So, David, continuing this journey of perhaps, you know, the more unusual, the oddities, um, how many turrets can you get out of a tank? The independent. Yeah, so a fantastically advanced vehicle when you think this is actually designed by Vickers, 1922. You know, the war's only been over for four years. The First World War ended. And the army says, look, we want to design for a vehicle that if we do have another war, like the First World War, it's got to be able to cross trenches, suppressing fire against the enemy positions. At the same time, they're looking at the tank, Vickers Medium, fast, mobile, doing all those things we hoped the tank could do. So this is almost the safety net vehicle. Vickers come back with a design to meet the Army's requirements, but they also come up with this, which is their own idea of a potential tank that could help advance across the shell-strewn ground five turrets it's got a three pounder gun on it as well we experiment with it from about 1926 they only build one this one right the way through to the early 1930s and the idea is if war's declared we might relook at it but the amazing thing is it's very influential in a lot of other tank designs first tank with a turret with a gun that can shoot at airplanes yeah exactly and an elf as well so <laughs> But the idea of high, you know, lots of firsts on this vehicle. Russians copy it. They claim they've come up with the idea themselves. Germans, with one of their tank designs, also look at that vehicle as well. Multi-turreted. This is the first. And ironically, the only one built independent. The idea was maybe it was there for independent action. So, David, what makes this such of an oddity then? Yeah, it's not odd in the sense of so different for anything else but odd in the sense what if you come during wartime to a country that's never made a tank before but you might have to and that's why this picture or this vehicle fits in with that picture the sentinel it's an australian vehicle that was built because there was a a fear what if britain had fallen in europe america not in the war yet australia if it has to fight against the japanese alone what can it build so it builds this it's quite a clever tank for doing, you know, what it's got to do. In other words, they choose a gun that comes from Britain. They've got suspension that's on a French design. They're going to use American engines because they think they can get hold of those and part of the transmission system, American. But they put that together, make this vehicle, and for a one-off, for a first attempt at a tank, it's actually not that bad. This is a two pounder gun. They actually got later in the war, they used a British 17 pounder gun, thick cast armor, you know, it works. So for a very first attempt at a tank, brilliant. So David, a tank really that needs no introduction, really, you talk to the lovable monstrosity. Yeah, not for your fans, but um, obviously very popular in the game, I gather. But for us here, it's that story of when you have a new war, what's that going to be like for the armoured corps? What it's going to be like for the soldiers who are going to serve in tanks? What's the nature of warfare coming? And what the British did in 1939, they call back the designers of the tanks in the First World War, hence TOG, T-O-G, the old gang. And they're brought back and given the task of, if we have similar warfare to World War I, maybe trench lines, maybe fortified positions. We're gonna to have to break through. What can you come up with for a tank for us? And they work on what we now see as this monstrosity, 80 tons, the heaviest tank in the museum. Uh, this is TOG-2, change of iteration, different turret, different three inch gun put on it, very thick armor. Surprisingly, if you see footage of it driving, much more mobile than perhaps we thought it was. Um, but it wasn't the way warfare went in the Second World War. So the project was really dropped in 1943. But the old gang, those people who'd done it all in the First World War, even the people who built it, Fosters of Lincoln, they're the guys who built the tank in the First World War. So that same team comes back together. In this case, they're not actually needed in World War II. But you can see what the issue is. Maybe warfare goes that way. We've got something ready for that. Welcome back everybody and thank you for watching that an amazing clip which were truly unusual vehicles. They were 
and I think the word that was used was slightly weird sometimes. I know many of you are asking for more Christmas jumper uh, shots and uh, clips, but to make up for this slight uh, mishap early with the giveaways, I'm gonna make sure to go through some of these advent giveaways. All you're gonna do is be active in chat. I will be pulling from randomly. All you're gonna do is just keep typing things, not spamming, uh, and make sure that you're staying active for drops as well, which we'll go through shortly. But we're gonna roll it now. Uh, I can see everybody's suddenly getting very, very happy and excitable on here. I'm gonna click the button and all I'm gonna do is then pull out a number from this drawer. I will tell you what code you're giving away. You need to reach out to this account or to a moderator just to let them know your name, uh, preferably your in-game name, but then we can make sure you get your code. So the first person is that I'm gonna have here is Martin Ecker 10, which is a hell of a name to try and pronounce. So Martin Ecker 10, you get door number three. Hopefully I don't break this advent drawer, which is slightly broken and you get yourself actually three large boxes. So uh, like we mentioned earlier, Holiday Ups is going on and three large boxes will allow you to get multitude of rewards from resources, premium time gold and premium vehicles. So there you go, Martin Ecker, you have yourself three large premium boxes. We're gonna re-roll it now uh, and see who we get. And Vakolak one, I apologize for the pronunciation, but V-A-R, C-O-L-A-C-1, woo, yes, woo woo, you get door number four, which is actually, let's see, you actually get four large boxes. Make sure, again, you please PM us your in-game name, verify you're there, we will go through it, reach out to moderator, reach out to the World of Tanks account, we'll get you your four large boxes. So happy holidays and Merry Christmas on this one. Uh, let's do number five, let's see what the next person wins. And that is, I am a CPC underscore COM uh, who says, eek, hello, welcome. Uh, and you have won four large boxes, congratulations. You know the drill, you know what to do. Please make sure you claim your reward by the end of the stream and have an amazing time. And then finally, just before we go on to the next topic that we have on here, let's click a quick roll it is car boom considering the fv4005 or the beat barn uh, topic that's an apt username going on there you have won yourself a vip bonus code now these are codes that are physical printed on a piece of metal we will pass you that code and tell you the rewards and what's in those but you can be assured it's a pretty cool one and they're worth quite a lot and collectible okay so now that we've done the advent giveaway for now, we're gonna come back and do a little bit more. Uh, I wanna move on to what is uh, a topic that is near and dear to a lot of tankers hats and that's your favorite vehicle. Now I'm gonna mention a vehicle. Many of you that watch my streams will know what my favorite vehicle normally is, but this time it's gonna be a surprise. Many of you will assume it's actually the TOG 2. Now the TOG 2 is not very lean. It is very big uh, and it is very mean and it's quite a heavy tank, but I have a new one today and I have brought props. These are available in the museum and that's gonna be the tortoise. Now the tortoise is something I love because it's actually the second biggest or heaviest, should I say, vehicle that uh, I know of that was produced in the time period. Now this vehicle is basically something that was produced to do a very particular type of role and it does have a code name, but I always remember the name tortoise specifically in game because that's about as fast as it moves. It's well armored, has an amazing gun. It's very British. I'm not biased at all that all my favorite tanks are British. Uh, and it meant essentially in real life, it was meant to be kind of like a breakthrough tank. It kind of rolled forward, it did, did its job, and it was to bounce and deter enemies from shooting at as much as possible by firing back very powerful and mean shells. We went through briefly with the FP4005, how important it was to have vehicles that were meant to deter, overcome certain obstacles. And that was a British tank design philosophy there. It's like, here's a problem, here's how we fix it. Let's make it bigger, give it a bigger gun. Doesn't matter how slow it is, let's just make it do its job well. Uh, I'm sure you can see on screen some of those assets and what's going on there. Now, the reason I'm going through this with you is because unfortunately I wasn't here during this segment when Richard and Nick filmed this for their favorite vehicle in the tank museum, which you should go and see right now. This is my favorite tank. This is the British Mark IV heavy tank of the First World War. These tanks were produced in larger numbers than any other, over a thousand. This is a male, so she is equipped with six pounder guns. The females were machine gun armed. It's a horrible vehicle, it really is. I mean, there's eight guys in there. The engine sits in the middle. The air is full of carbon monoxide. It actually takes four just to drive and steer the thing and she is very, very vulnerable. The armor is just about thick enough to keep out machine gun rounds. If a shell comes along, 
she's pounded into scrap metal. But these tanks did great things. This is the tank of Combray in November 1917. Tanks like this smashed a hole in the Siegfriedstellung, what we call the Hindenburg Line. Toughest bit of German defences. And that hole is six miles wide and four miles deep for remarkably few casualties. This is where armoured warfare comes of age. The Challenger 1 is one of my favourite tanks here in the collection. We have three of them, two for our running fleet and one very historic one on display in the museum that uh, actually has quite a bit of history in the first Gulf War. This one, ever since I've been here, which is now about just over eight years, we've had this running done an engine change on it a while back and the guys literally standing around us here while we're being filmed did a lot of good work on this in recent weeks we had a bad oil leak this year this season and when they had everything out the engine and the gearbox i just like the technology of it uh, how it's all this power pack at the back how it's all engineered i like that it served clearly in the first gulf war so it has a combat history i like the link to this one of the last british built and designed tanks i think it looks great it has this sinister slick look on it because of the angles because of the armor packs fitted underneath it's great sound vehicle yeah it just ticks all those boxes of firepower protection mobility of course as a key tank and it's one of my favorite ones that we use in our running collection because it has proven itself in combat because it looks great it sounds great and I like the technology behind it. it's clearly a, a very complex vehicle as well if you look in the turret and the engine the automotive side and the hydro gas suspension everything so every time the guys look at it they really enjoy looking over their shoulders just to see how it's built and what it takes to keep this going. And yeah, I'm very proud of the work they've done on this and I look forward to seeing this going for many, many more years in our arena. This tank behind me is a Centurion Mark V and it's one of those vehicles that for me epitomizes what a tank should be. It's also for people of my generation, it was that tank that was a dinky toy. You can see we've displayed it here with a dinky toy box behind it. And it kind of fulfills that, the ideal tank. It was reliable. It was well armoured. It could be upgunned. It started life with a 17 pounder gun, went on to this one, the 20 pounder, then the famous L7 105 millimetre gun. So it saw great service, 13 marks of gun tank in British service. And of course, it was sold around the world, sees action in the Middle East, Far East, Vietnam War, Indo-Pakistan War, it's seen a lot of action in its time. And amazingly, for a tank that goes into service just after World War II, still in service to this day with the South Africans. So one of those amazing vehicles, sort of generation tank, people knew how to fix. You can see where the engine is, you can see the gearing, etc. For people of my generation, maybe that's a fear of modern stuff, black box technology, no one understands it at all. This is a tank you can sit in, have a look around you. You kind of can work out what it's there for, what it does, and a classic bit of great British tank design. This is a Sherman Crab, and the Crab is my favorite tank. It's a regular Sherman tank, but it's got this flail attached to it at the beginning for the purposes of clearing mines. Now the Sherman flail tank, the Crab was developed by the 79th Armored Division, which was a formation that was created and raised by Royal Tank Regiment Officer Percy Hobart, specifically for training men who would be using specialized armor like this for the Normandy invasion. Why is it my favorite tank? Well, like the smell of the place, I remember this vehicle very, very clearly from my first visit to the tank museum when I was eight years old. And my eight-year-old brain thought that this was a tank that was clearly capable of uh, some serious devastation. Hi guys, I'm Fam the Tank Man, and I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite tanks, which is this goofy looking vehicle right here. So this is the Praying Mantis. It's an experimental prototype from the Second World War. And the idea with this vehicle was to be able to peek over cover, stuff like really tall walls or fences and stuff like that. The way that this is done, the center section here actually raises upwards when it's operated. You've got a crew of two that are actually laying on their bellies in that center section. So they're also laying on their bellies when it's being raised up as well. You've got a little turret at the front there, which is referred to as the helmet, which has two Bren light machine guns in it. It looks absolutely bizarre when this thing is actually operating. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Now, when they trialed this, they found that the crew got motion sickness pretty badly because, again, they're laying on their bellies and wobbling around in a very small box. So, yeah, not really ideal. A very, very good concept, but a very, very poor execution. So that is the Praying Mantis. 
Now, when asked to pick one favorite tank, it's pretty difficult to be honest. However, I had to pick the FV 4201 Chieftain main battle tank for no other reason, perhaps, other than it was the very first tank that I served on. The Cold War Icon, armed with a rifled 120 mm gun, it was a bit of a beast, especially with the advent of the TLS tank laser sight and the actual rangefinder that we had on there. It was incredibly accurate. Now, of course, because it was the very first tank that I served on, it will always hold a special place in my heart. Yes, I know it did have problems. Certainly from the driver's perspective, there was a lot of time spent with your head in the back decks, but it always shall remain my favorite tank. My favorite tank is the Panzer IV. The reason for this is its longevity. It arrived with the Panzer divisions in 1939 in the attacking Poland. It's still there in 1945 when Germany has been invaded and crushed. But this tank sticks with the Panzer divisions all the way through. It's the only tank within any of the armies that are out there in World War II that survives for that length of time. The reason for this is quite simple. It's the gun. Basically, what we're looking at is the L24. This is the 7.5 centimeter gun that it has at the beginning of the war. This is to allow it to be an escort tank. By mid-1942, the Germans realized they need to be able to combat tanks like the T-34 and KV-1. So what they do is they add the L-48 gun. This is a longer gun, and what they do in here, shorten the breech and basically create a smaller ammunition round. And so the recoil is less. This gives it a tank killing capability of hitting things like the Cromwell tank at 1,000 meters. This is why this tank even though it's box-like and hasn't got the advanced armor that you have with the other tanks, it's capable of knocking out tanks all the way to the end of the war. And this is why this is my favorite tank. And welcome back, everybody. I'll leave it up to you to decide who's got the best favorite tank. Uh, I've got no bias here. Many of you will already be claiming your drops if you are on Twitch, and that is going to reward you either at five times five XP victories or the VIC and the Ashram Rex. If you watch for two hours in total, you will get one day of premium, a T7 combat car or the Lorraine 40T. Don't forget there have been changes to drops, so you need to make sure that you are following all the rules and making sure you're doing everything you can to get the drops. If you're on the Tank Museum chat, I believe a me fantastic member of the Tank Museum staff are running some giveaways there with codes. But before we get on to too much, I'd like to make sure that we talk about uh, some more Advent giveaways. I, the reason I'm kind of going on with this is to make sure everybody has some time to type into the chat here that we start pulling some more doors. We're gonna do very quickly six of them, so make sure you're paying attention. So the first person that we're gonna go here is Mortimer, I think it is. It's not spelled Mortimer, it's M-O-R-7-I-M-3-R, and you have won a Sherman Firefly code. That comes with 100% crew and a garage slot. So that's well done to you. Number eight door is gonna go to, let's see, Latia15. And you have won yourself a VIP bonus code again. Remember, reach out to moderator, PM this channel, and we will make sure that you get your bonus code that will give you the reward that we mentioned. Next up, we have Dear Lord, E-R-T-U-G-R-U-L-2071. Um, and you have won yourself the four large boxes. Congratulations and well done. Let's see what we've got next. Who are we gonna win for this one is Cranky Monkey ORM. Congratulations, I recognize you as a regular on here. Four large boxes and congratulations. Reach out to a DM or to the museum channel. Let's see here. Rerolling for Marco Muzij. Uh, you've won three large boxes. And next up we have for door number 12, a heavy tank number six, and that is gonna to win to SPM underscore 44. SPM underscore 44. And that's the list of the advent calendar giveaways. We do, as you see, have two lots of six more to go. So there will be two segments more of advent calendar giveaways. Don't forget there's a drops going on. Say hello and make sure you're taking part into the giveaway on the Tank Museum channel. But before then, next up is the Victory Rolls presenting, and I wanna make sure I get the song right, is I'd like to hitch a ride with Santa Claus. There's 
a new little boy in the neighborhood And last night it started to snow He brought out his sleigh and was all set to play But the gang didn't say hello So I made friends with a poor little tyke And he said to me, do you know what I like? He likes tanks, he likes tanks I'd like to hitch a ride with Santa Claus Wouldn't that be something to see? I'd like to hitch a ride with Santa Claus Dodging the clouds, waving at crowds I'd crack the whip and keep a watch for weather vanes I'd help him with his bag and check each Christmas tag or maybe I could handle the reins. I'd like to hitch a ride with Santa Claus. Wouldn't they be jealous of me? You couldn't say I ran away because after we roam, he'll drive me home. And when they see me Christmas morning, what'll they say with a look of delight? There goes the boy that rode with Santa Claus last night. I crack the whip and keep a watch for Help him with his bag and check each Christmas tag Or maybe I could handle the reins I'd like to hitch a ride with Santa Claus Wouldn't they be jealous of me? You couldn't say I ran away because after we roam He'll drive me home And when they see me Christmas morning What'll they say with the look of delight? There goes the boy that rode with Santa Claus last night. There goes the boy that hitched a ride with Santa Claus last night. Fantastic. A massive thank you to the Victory Rolls. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll now, see you later. See you later. Now, Nick, of course, Tanks in Popular Culture, relatively new exhibition for the Tank Museum. It certainly is, yeah. So in this exhibition, what we're doing is looking at all the different ways that people have encountered tanks in our culture, whether that's through literature, you can see comic books are represented, but it's not just that, of course, it's model making, and of course, increasingly video games, as well as we've discussed, uh, but also news media and films and television and all that sort of thing, toys and games, etc., etc. So that's what this exhibition's all about. It's a bit of a different kind of exhibition for us here at the Tank Museum. Normally, obviously, we're very much rooted in history of events, of warfare and conflict. So this one is designed to be a little bit lighter. It's a very colourful exhibition, isn't it? That's the first thing that struck me, to be honest, when I came in here. It is. It's a really nice space, isn't it? Bright and colourful and, you know, we've got some interesting... I'll say, I think we have to stop for a minute and appreciate the stools there. They are fantastic, aren't they? <laughs> For all the model makers out there, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, so some of the vehicles that we've got in this collection here would include this Scorpion tank, which is, uh, if you can see, if you, if you look up there, Wes, we've got the uh, Action Man box. So this is the type of tank that Action Man was cutting about in in the 1970s. I don't know if you had an Action yeah, Man. Yeah, I mean, from a point of view and nostalgia, I mean, I remember vividly receiving this yeah at Christmas. at Christmas um, and it was you know probably that and my racing bike which I got um, was one of the best Christmas presents I think I've ever got I mean even I had an action man and that was in the, but that was in the 80s that's GI Joe for our American uh, our American viewers here and right at the end here as well is perhaps one of the more famous tanks in our collection and again that's a reference to the fact that you know tanks have been a big part of movies that's the fury that was actually used in the movie the fury uh, crewed by Brad Pitt and co. But of course, there's been lots of fantastic tank movies over time. We all know Kelly's Heroes, 
Bridge Too Far, I'm sure you can think of a few favourites. One of our favourites. I have to say, Nick, I mean, is, is Fury a big draw for the museum? I can imagine it is. It really is, even though that movie is, well, it's almost 10 years it old is, now, yeah. I suppose, yeah. isn't it? But yeah, it's still very, very popular. I mean, it's constantly on Netflix. And it's one of those movies where, you know, those modern sort of World War II movies, the special effects are absolutely fantastic. And I think it's one of those things that helps get people interested in, in the subject of tanks and, and armoured fighting vehicles, like Action Man did, like Airfix did, and like World of Tanks does today. Uh, but yeah, tanks are also seen in the media as well, in the news media, and of course, you know, that photograph from Tiananmen so Square arguably, back yeah, in 99, one of the most, most famous yeah, exactly. photographs ever yeah. taken. And this here is uh, Michael, which is the oldest Sherman we think the oldest Sherman in the world. And again, you know, when this vehicle arrived in the UK, it was, you know, played around in the media quite a lot. This was the first Lendley Sherman and it was used by the media at the time to symbolize that really close relationship between Britain and the United States at that time. And something, again, a vehicle dear to my heart. The Ferret Scout the ferret, car. Oh, yeah, you like this vehicle, don't you? I do you? like this vehicle. We were talking about this the other day, actually, and the reason I liked this is because it was um, just sort of, we were, I mean, obviously, predominantly, my career was all about tanks. Mm. Uh, and the only time we did it was when we went to Cyprus, um, attached to the Sovereign Base Wrecking Troop, and we got Saladin armoured cars, and we got Ferret Scout cars. And I have to say, and I was a driver on one of these, and it is the most fun you could ever have driving something. Is it quick? Gear. It is quick. Um, I won't say it, but obviously if you, dis you know, disconnect the governor, it's even a bit quicker. But it's such fun to drive. Pre-select gearbox, takes a bit of getting used to, but once it does, I mean, what a glorious vehicle. So those so who aren't engineering minded, what is pre-selected gearbox? What does yeah, that so in mean? essence, you, you sort of selected the gear mm -hmm. and then you, you hit right. the, cl the clutch pedal. So you pre-selected it, yeah. you put it in second, then you hit it and then it would always match okay. go to second, okay. blah, blah, blah. So it's to say, it took a bit of getting used to, but um, such a fun vehicle to drive. <laughs> really, really good fun. And what we've got over here in the background, you can see our first World War tank. This is, again, another vehicle that starred in a movie, uh, the Spielberg movie War Horse. And it's only in the movie for a fraction of a second. Like, you know, blink and you'll miss it. But the time, effort and detail that was put into this is absolutely phenomenal. So it's a replica. It's obviously not real. Uh, and yet it's fantastic for us because this is the vehicle that comes out of Tankfest and allows us to show off what a first World War tank looks like when it moves. And Very think, useful during the centenary. Of course, and I think the whole exhibition, and this in particular, emphasises that the Tank Museum is not just for all those, you know, the, the hardcore tank nuts. No, um, it is, you know, it's very, very family orientated in here as well. It certainly is, yeah. The, the area where we have our set in is, is a fantastic little area where, uh, you know, the kids can make themselves at home, play Top Trumps, which is another classic game where tanks have been featured. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very bright, lively space. There's often people spending time in here just kind of having fun together. It's great. Which is fantastic. Now we're back here. Now, David, what is, um, there seems to be a lot of ration packs around. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I got a little peckish, felt a little hungry. It's late, <laughs> it's late in the day right now. Uh, I already discovered that there's some very crushed candy in that one. Oh, wow. This one was some miscellaneous food that wasn't that interesting. And mine was full of far more interesting. So this is all, we've not actually seen any of this before, so we've got a variety of ration packs here, um, all for our American friends, uh, MREs. David, we did, t we did uh, talk about this, MRE, remember? Meal ready to eat. There you go. I uh, failed it the first time, not the second time. <laughs> so yeah, so what I've got here is the American ration pack. Let's take a look and see what we've got in here. We've got some chocolate protein drink powder. I'm not sure that sounds particularly appetizing. I don't know what that is. White wheat snack bread. Tip. On the box it says <laughs> elbow macaroni in tomato sauce. I don't know what elbow tastes like. I have no doesn't, idea what elbow tastes sound like. Um, macaroni, I could, I could, maybe I'll talk I think what's this. really interesting, I mean, of course, for me, as soon as I see ration packs, it's, um, you know, not great <laughs> reflection of the time I was in the army. You know, not, it's not renowned for the amazing food in there. But again, you can see different countries do different menus. I mean, Nick, you've got a, a menu 12 there, whatever it was relative to that. A um, substantial packet of applesauce. <laughs> And of course, these, these rations, they come in at such a variety of shapes and sizes. Certainly for us in tank crews, at one stage we had four-man ration packs, so you would get more tin foods um, for us. Um, then they changed, we've got Arctic rations in the uh -huh. British Army. It's all sorts of things, high in calories, keep you warm, keep you up your energy levels. 
A bit different in the tanks, of course, because, you know, we have, I know I hate to say it, but the poor old infantry haven't got, you know, they have to carry everything with them. Uh, we were yep. very lucky. We had a dedicated stowage bin where we would keep all our rations. Um, we've obviously got a cooker and, of course, yep. the very famous BV or the boiling vessel you've got inside there as well. So, In the British ration pack, was there anything so this you is, used this to is enjoy? Apparently, I have to say, this is a British ration pack, but again, <laughs> I'll be honest, it's not, it's not one I actually recognise <laughs> um, at all. You always got the, um, the condiments. I see the important element there, the tea. Yep. Um, <laughs> Tea, very critical, of course, as well. This is um, a single-man ration pack, of course, so um, you've also got a spoon inside there and all your good add-ons like salt and pepper and all the rest of it as mm -hmm. well. Interestingly, again, for tank crews, what we tended to do was, for our rations, we'd heard of lots of add-ons, so you'd buy things like proper soups um, that, you know, <laughs> okay. from the supermarket, we'd have tomato sauce, we'd have all those sort of luxuries, but again, only because we could carry that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Obviously, the poor old infantry trap couldn't as well. Um, coffee inside there. The worst thing about, um, I don't know, I'm sure it's the same for most ration packs with the coffee, but it's always hard. You know, you get uh, that horrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard, hard coffee. So, um, yeah, it just didn't work particularly well um, in there. Other things we've got, um, this looks absolutely fantastic. Chocolate uh, brownie. Chocolate brownie, Can't go wrong. obviously <laughs> high in calories. A lot of this stuff, um, you could just add water to, um, mm. of course, and it would actually be fantastic, again, for us in tanks with the BV, much easier for us to use it and Let's everything. See, a bit of curry. A bit of Can't curry. Wrong with that. Um, <laughs> one of your favourites, I think, then, isn't it? Vegetable and chickpea biryani. Well, it sounds pretty good to me, yeah. Try that later on. <laughs> <laughs> Try that later on. Um, numerous drinks, numerous soups as well. Um, again, this is quite a hefty ration pack, actually. And again, the different menus on there. So what you would have got, I'm not sure that this actually tells you what, what menu it belongs to or anything on there. Um, so it's different types of menus, so it's not one kit. No, that's not it, at all. all I mean, done. Well, you'd have to imagine if you were yeah. on exercise for, mm -hmm. let's say, two weeks, mm -hmm. you're not going to eat tomato pasta salad every single day, are you? <laughs> I guess so. not. You'd get a little bored of that, wouldn't you? You would you get a little bored. So you? there were different menus. Yeah. And of course, you've also got halal rations, mm. you've got mm -hmm. you know, vegetarian yeah, options yeah. and all that as well. Um, and you usually, for each ration pack, you'd get sort of a breakfast menu, yep. you get a lunch menu, and then you get something for your evening meal as well. Did you um, have a favourite meal in the tank uh, rations? I'll be honest, I, th I think, David, like I said, sort of, implied earlier that you got so sick and tired of mm -hmm. rations after a while because I mean even though there aren't different menus and that it's just only so much of the same thing that you yep. could eat you know hand on hand I mean in the 80s of course we we went on exercise a lengthy yep. amount so we yeah. sometimes would be out in the field for over a month or something so yeah. to do that it would be supplemented with fresh stuff because obviously the one thing they're all lacking is like fresh vegetables yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you could do get dried fruit inside some of them, etc. Okay. But you're really lacking on some of that. So the SQMS, the squadron, quartermaster sergeant will bring out perhaps fresh bread, some mm. fresh milk, or some vegetables or something to bolster it up a bit mm. as well. Um, so what have you got in your box? So here? I, I you've know, got a very smart one. Here, <laughs> yeah, we. I, I know there's a, a rumor that the French know how to eat really well. Um, I found that out while I was in Paris. So I know I already felt a little packish, and I had a fruit bar that was concentrated raspberry sweetness that. I think you mentioned you've tried one in the past and it was... I did try one. It's interesting. so sweet. sweet. <laughs> uh, a combat fuel mocha bar of denseness. I have no idea what it's for. <laughs> um, we have some tissues, which I believe you said were... Multiple uses. Yeah, <sighs> obligatory, you have to have. Uh, a cocoa hot drink, and then I can't see what's in there. We even have a mint tea drink. Apparently that's important for Where, Where's people. the cocoa van? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one I was ironically looking forward to, we mentioned this when we landed, it's been a while since I had a fondue, and here's a, a miniature fondue that you can enjoy going on there, which I think is very fancy when you're going on there. But straight away, even from, I mean, look at the one I've got in front of me, British, I mean, it's all bunged in a bag. Yours yeah. is very neatly packed yeah. in a box. <laughs> it comes with a, a separate cooking utensil. We have expensive sardines. One of my colleagues tells me about is these are the, the primo and the very best sardines that you can get. I know you're not necessarily... I'm not, I'm not a fan of sardines. You're not going to no. go with the sardines. No. We have a fun isotonic drink, muesli breakfast, <laughs> some more soups, some weird comfy jam, uh, very fancy looking wheat biscuits that we have going on here. Some more cereal bars. Is it common to have so many cereal and chocolate bars and things like this? No. 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 The, these are the fancy ones. Some nougat, which I will definitely eat while the camera's not on me. Uh, and then, of course, we have, I'm assuming is a very interesting meal, which is tuna, coconut, rice, basmati style, and a couscous, red pepper, nice little dish on there. So it's a very fancy meal. Now, we do have some other alternative ration packs which I won't go through and this was a pride and joy of a colleague where he he likes to say this is his, his average breakfast of 5,272 calories wow. in 
a, a nice big pack, but I, I believe this is operational, uh, a, a winter one that's going on there. A, a Belgium, I think he said it was. Oh, okay. I think, yeah. I think. So it's a nice winter ration pack, which of course you need lots of calories when it's very, very cold. Um, I don't know which one you'd prefer out of the three. <laughs> Well, I have to say, going through yours, David, I mean, yours is like a sort of Fortnum and Mason level, isn't <laughs> well, it? it really is. I don't think you'd make many friends if you opened up the uh, fish in the turret of a tank, but... Would that be a problem? Um, a fish I, I, a I mean, personally, I'm not a fish, you know, I'm not a fish <laughs> fan, um, so I don't actually eat fish at all, so that would it's be a, a problem for me as well. But you have to say, though, I mean, it's just, um, it's so well displayed and everything. I mean, it's great. Um, the British one is, you know, well, we're British. I'm going to see if I can get it all back into the box okay or not, because it seems very, you could tell somebody had the dimensions of this box and went, here's the cubic dimensions of all these ingredients, good luck. Uh, and see if you can fit it all in there. And I say, but the variety of rations that you can buy is, is unbelievable. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of these you know, survival shops, etc., sell them as well. Um, so they are, you know, it's incredibly rare. Um, and it's amazing, I think, to look at just a few of the countries that do it and the differences yep. they do it in there and what they are. But I think the one thing they've all got in common, as I said, you know, it's important to have lots of calories. Yeah. Um, you know, keep yourself warm, keep yourself hydrated. Do treats. Obviously this as well. Treats as well. You've got Skittles, which is mm. quite nice, I think. I think it's now a Skittle at this point. Well, yes, it seems to <laughs> sort of solidify. <laughs> it does solidify a bit. Um, and we did have, I was a bit, we were actually warned not to try one particular one. I um, can't remember which one it was. I think it might have been the British one, wasn't it? That had a, I'm not sure. One of them was... Uh, had a run out date. A little bit out of date. A little bit out. 2021, I think. 2021. <laughs> so we didn't actually like to do that on camera. Oh, this uh, was 2017. Camera. That would explain uh, why it's a single. Skittle. It's still good. Yeah. Um, but as I said, yeah, for me, I mean, not very often, to be honest, we got these individual ration packs. It was slightly different for the tank crews, and we were, there's no denying it, we were spoilt um, compared oh, okay. to some people, um, the ability to carry everything. Would you get special ration packs or anything for Christmas time? No, absolutely no, not. No, no turkey dinner. No, no, whole turkey in the bag. <laughs> there is no special ration pack for Christmas. I mean, it's. Um, what you using, I mean, obviously, if you were out, unfortunate enough to be uh -huh. away or out in operations or something at Christmas, um, you would have maybe uh, the catering station, so the catering call would come out, they would erect a tent or something, maybe cook you a special meal. But of course, if yep. you're on operation operations, then mm -hmm. there's none of that at all. I mean, no. you have you have what you have, but no, certainly, no, no, no. certainly nowhere. No. But it's a good idea. Maybe we maybe. should suggest this to the uh, Ministry of Defence or something. And do you swap? the packs or ingredients certain bits it's, with other it's a very good i mean obviously uh, certainly for us when we were the last gulf war when we were serving in iraq um we were always swapping with the americans um because <laughs> i'm not sure if it's because well, i think it probably is because the american rations certainly tasted better for us but it was that, again it was that all about that variety you know mm -hmm. it's um having the same thing over and over again and they love to swap with us as well so okay it was another way you could get variety and any other nation you came across we used to trade rations yeah, yeah, yeah. okay so amongst other things that, that was how you got around the lack of variety sometimes that like, was please, please yeah. just give me something exactly exactly <laughs> exactly so there you go ration packs um okay i think nick you're going to tuck into something um, well, there's so much choice. <laughs> I, I might avoid the stuff that's out of date, though. And um, while they do do that, we're going to have a little break. And what we're going to do now is hand over to our friends in North America, um, people I'm sure you'll recognise, but we'll let them introduce themselves. So enjoy. From the Ontario Regiment Museum. We are here in the M577 that is appropriately decked out for holiday cheer. Oh, wow, we've blown our production budget, so that's it from the live stream. <laughs> we've got a train, we've got the chieftain, we've got the executive director, the tank museum guy, and we hope that you enjoy the stream. And welcome to our live stream. I'm Commander AF. I'm here at the Ontario Regiment Museum. This man should need no introduction, but I will allow him to introduce himself. I'm Nicholas. I've been a tankaholic for over 20 years. I'm not planning on recovering. Some okay. of you may know him as the Chieftain. He's a tankaholic and a trainaholic, and we'll talk more about that shortly. But first, I want to introduce Jeremy Blowers, the executive director here at the Ontario Regiment Museum. 
He's going to be tagging along with us this whole this whole time while we're having extra special fun here in the M577. Happy holidays, everybody. So th this is our opportunity. So you, you would have seen Jeremy show up in previous videos or maybe you would have heard him in the background during the Aquino live stream. So un unlike, uh, unlike Bobby, you don't really have the staff to, to have somebody on the live stream as well. You're, you're too busy. That's to right. Yes, yeah, so I'm usually in the background and you guys often mention me, oh look, there goes uh, Tank Museum guy running this way and running that way. But now that it's the Christmas season, um, I can be on with you guys. Yeah. So, I mean, that's your handle, is Tank Museum Guy. Yeah, both in-game and online, and sort of where I post some of the adventures we get to uh, here at the museum. Okay, so this is, I guess, your opportunity to really introduce Ontario Regiment Museum to the larger audience. I mean, we, we've, we, we've broadcast from here before. You have seen this video here before, but I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've actually sat down and talked about what this museum is, why it's so fantastic, and where is it? All right, well, the Ontario Regiment RCAC Museum, which means Royal Canadian Armoured Corps, is uh, Canada's premier tank museum. We are uh, a regimental museum of the Ontario Regiment, but we are one of North America's largest collections of military vehicles, including tanks. And I think the, the thing that sets uh, the ORM apart over here is the amount of vehicles that we run. So it's mostly an operational and, and mobile vehicle museum. You've got like 150 plus in the collection, right? 150 plus in the collection and over 120 are running at any time. Okay, so what about this vehicle that we're in right now? I know that you guys call it the Queen Mary. I'm not sure if our American friends also call it the Queen Mary, <laughs> but, I, but I did discover that the British call it that as well. Right. So it's not just a Canadian thing. Well, it's named after a British ship. So the, okay. the M577 is the uh, command, mobile command and control uh, APC. Uh, as you can see, it's very big in here. It's an office. Uh, we were able to, you know, have our, our Christmas set up in here. And it's so big, actually, that, you know, the Commonwealth troops call it the Queen Mary, uh, named after a Second World War troop ship that was very large. We uh, sometimes call it the RV as well. It's a bit of an RV. I mean, you know, you have everything you need in here. And in addition, I mean, on the top, there's a big mod tent that deploys out. So if you're going to be in a static position for a while, it's actually quite comfy for the officers and communication staff. Have you ever seen it decked out like this? No, no. Do you think you'll be doing this every year? I think we might just keep it this way. <laughs> that, that'll be so, yeah, I mean, you had a, uh, I think you had a vehicle at a Christmas market or something like that a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, so our vehicles, because they're mobile, uh, in our community, we send them out to all sorts of different events. And we sent a Canadian Lab 3 to uh, the Oshawa Christmas market. So, you know, it's, it's weird in our part of the world, but our people who live around here are used to seeing tanks and military vehicles rolling through their streets and going to different parades and events. It's just... Uh, no panics about martial law happening. In a non-threatening way. It's pretty exciting. And I like how you glazed over my talk about decorations. I was about to get into it. And you know what? I think the two of you... you You've got a okay, little bit. Decorate. I'm, I'm sort of the bad humble. Okay, the we've got. A, I'm, I'm here to bring the holiday spirit. So you, they, they're going to talk tanks, but let me just get a little fun and festive, okay? And I see that, of course. He's wearing a green shirt. Uh, there's a green shirt, but he's Irish after all. But you are a little boring. So to help you fit in and bring the holiday cheer, I know that you do like to wear a collared shirt. So I got you. Um, a tie. Got you a tie. Okay. Sorry. Here we go. Oh. Really nice. Very festive. Okay. Oh, well, you're not getting off the hook. I am very proud of you. I love your ugly tank sweater from, oh, from the Tank Museum. Shout out to our friends over in the UK. I have every one. So it looks like you got a Chieftain, you got a, uh, it says probably a Mark IV. Uh, the, I, I cannot identify reindeer type. No, I'm not, not sure what the reindeer are. It has, yeah, I, yeah, I got this from the Tank Museum and I, I get one every year. Oh That's my goodness. every year. That means what, does the Tank Museum have a new design in their shop every year? They do, yeah. Okay, they call it a tank jumper. Here in North America, we call it an ugly Christmas tank sweater. Well, I've got something from the Ontario Regiment Museum gift shop. They're not very festive, but they are pretty cool. Oh, our tank socks. Tank yeah, socks. with our logo on them. Okay, so. Thank you, Commander. You guys are wanting some gifts. We need to get you tanker boots. Yeah. I'm not wearing them today either for a change. The Ontario Regiment Museum gift shop's where it's at. And the Tank Museum gift shop's pretty cool too. Um, so yeah, okay, now we are a little bit more aligned. We're a little bit more in the holiday spirit. Best of yeah. 
Uh, we can get back to the tank talk. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the museum itself. So I mean, this it it is a, an uh, official Canadian museum, or is this a private collection? This is a official Canadian Armed Forces museum, uh, but that but it also has a civilian charity which owns actually now a vast majority of the vehicles in the collection. We also, like many other museums, we have some private collector's vehicles that are on loan to our museum that add to the, the strength of the collection. But everything you see here that, that came out of the Canadian Armed Forces, like the LAV-3, was actually an active Canadian military vehicle, and now it's, it's here for educational purposes. So Oshawa itself has something of a military history. I mean, we're, st we're staying in Ajax, which is a couple of towns down the road. It's named after a warship from the Battle of the River Plate. And uh, so Oshawa has got what in, in, in terms of the military history? Well, the Ontario Regiment was founded in 1866. America's older than something. That's right. Uh, which actually makes the regiment one year older than, than the Confederation of Canada. Because uh, Canada wasn't confederated until 1867. So yeah, our military history goes longer than uh, our time as a, an actual nation. And yeah, the factories here. Yes, uh, General Motors factory was here that produced um, over uh, hundreds of thousands of vehicles for the, for the uh, war effort in the Commonwealth during the Second World War. Some of them we have in our museum. And it's also the site of uh, uh, the famous Camp X, the secret spy camp here in North America. And even where the, the museum is. I'm going to go Google that one after this. Though. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard Chieftain say he's missed that one. You're, you're bringing new facts to the table. I'm bringing okay. new facts about Durham Region. It was very active during the Second World War and has a very deep military history. Good. So one of the other nice things about like about Toronto is it's, uh, if you like tanks or airplanes or ships or whatever, there's something here for, for you regardless. Yeah, within like a half hour drive of, of Toronto, yeah. Yeah, so you got, uh, what is it, Trenton Air Base? We've got the uh, Trenton uh, Royal Canadian Air Force Museum. So we have the Trenton Air Base, and there's a fantastic Air Force Museum there. Uh, just on the other side of Toronto, we have the Canadian Warplane Heritage uh, Museum. So for those who like military planes, um, lots within Toronto within an hour's drive. And we're not the only military vehicle and tank museum. We have CFV Warden Museum. Right, we had their vehicle at Aquino we showed you. Yeah, for sure. And they have an incredible historical collection. And of course, in Ottawa, a few more hours drive, we have the Canadian War Museum, which is the Canadian equivalent of, of say, like the Imperial War Museum. So there you go. If you're wondering where to go for your vacation next year, book Toronto. That, that, I think the, uh, the Ontario Regional uh, Tourism Board is now happy with us. They'll be very happy with us now. Now, we're about three weeks out from Christmas. Would we be booking trips to Toronto in, in uh, the dead of winter over here? What, is this considered the dead of winter? How, like, what do you think? Oh, we're out? not Are even we... close. Wait till February. Okay, so no. So December might be a good time. Well, what happens in February? Uh, by February, you're definitely going to be uh, in a lot of snow. And if you're visiting Canada from southern climes, um, you should probably bring a lot of winter gear in your coats. Okay, so you yeah. bringing the winter gear as just a human uh, pedestrian tourist, you definitely want to have sweaters, jackets, layers. But I did want to talk a little bit about what does it take to, to basically prepare. We're in a giant hangar. I don't know if you guys have caught on to that, but we are in a big tank hangar. There are not all 150 vehicles, but there are a lot of vehicles jam packed in here. It's walls of concrete and then just a garage door. Um, so. Fortunately, we're not freezing, but what does it take to prepare the museum for winter? Yeah, because we do something that, that no other museum does in North America, and I'm not sure, I, you know, there might be some of this stuff going on in, in Scandinavia, but we actually put on an educational tank show in the winter in February. Most people are coming to Ontario, by the way, for skiing and other uh, interesting tourism, but you, you always have a pretty hardcore audience. I, I can imagine standing out in the tank yard wearing parkas watching tanks go by. Not the usual hour and a half show, Nick. <laughs> okay, we try to keep it to 30, 40 minutes and mostly about how um, vehicles operate in winter conditions and some historical vehicles that have been deployed uh, to different theaters during the Cold War, like in Scandinavia. And yeah, it's, it's a lot different from running a Kino Tank Weekend or our regular summer program. And, uh, you know, I have asked uh, our Director of Operations, Dan Aker, he's going to give us kind of a rundown of, of some of the equipment we have to wear and, and how difficult it is for vehicles to, to move in but, snow and uh, ice. Okay, so this is a series of problems that they don't have in Europe. So Bobbington, pay attention, you might learn something. So you said it was Dan. Yeah, Dan has uh, prepared some stuff and he's going to talk to us about the military vehicles, 
uh, how we prepare them, how they operate in snow and ice, and also he has some really cool Canadian Arctic equipment. All right, do the, do the still say roll VT? Yeah, roll, roll the video. Canada used to run an exercise that was called Northern Viking. And what that was, what was sort of like a school of living in the north. It was up in the Northwest Territories and in the Arctic. And what would happen is uh, people would be nominated or would go on this course for a set period of time to get used to living. Now, there were armored vehicles there, but there weren't many of them. Most of the exercise was actually a walking exercise, snowshoes uh, and um, sleds bearing your, your equipment. Couple of interesting things about that. It was a great way to learn how to live in the North. Now, I never went on the exercise because I'm not that much of a masochist, but the stories I'd get would just act as learning tools for us in the South where we could practice the same techniques. Like for instance, if you wanted to have a bath or a shower and it's a bazillion degrees below zero, this is somewhat of a challenge. So what would happen is that you would be inside, they would set up a tent, they would put in the naphtha la lanterns, which would heat up the tent fairly quickly. You would uh, strip down completely and then run out into the snow, roll around in the snow, run back into the tent, and put your foot, one foot in each one of the wash basins. You would then soap yourself down as the snow becomes water. When you're sufficiently lathered up and you run out of the tent one more time, roll in the snow, run back in and use the snow that melts as the medium of removing the soap from the bottle. And then at which point in time you could get dressed again. One other bizarre, thing about Northern Viking was that polar bears would sometimes come into camp because of food waste and stuff and they'd be interested. So there was a, a sequence of events that when you saw a polar bear and you were in sentry, you would have to uh, start out with a whistle, then use a rattle. And, and then finally, the last thing that would happen is that you would have an M113 or another tracked vehicle that would basically herd it away from the camp because a polar bear, when motivated, uh, has to be deterred. Uh, and the other thing that was kind of interesting is that uh, Canada actually has what you call rangers. When you think of rangers, you think of people who climb mountains and uh, stab their way through German armies with bayonets and all that sort of thing. Canadian rangers are actually natives who live up north and they act as guides and they act as um, trainers for various detachments that will go up for Northern sovereignty issues. And so they have an incredible wealth of knowledge from living up there in the North that they pass on to the Canadian troops that go up for these periodic exercises. And the support they provide, uh, snowmobiles, uh, teaching people how to live in the North, that is um, training that, that is unparalleled and an experience that is unparalleled that I'm aware of with any other military. Other things about winter warfare, uh, your heating system is very important if it's working. And if it's not, it's like living in a refrigerator, uh, which just adds to the true joy of uh, the exercise in the field. One of the most interesting things about driving in the winter is ice. Uh, ice is not a good thing hard rubber pads against a icy surface, they do not get much grip at all. So one of the things that is done is to remove pads and replace them with grousers. And the grousers act like cleats and they will actually dig into the ice and give you much better traction on slippery roads. Um, Canadian track, deal track for the um, APCs actually are much easier to pry off, apparently, not having done it, but apparently uh, to remove the uh, rubber pads uh, and replace them with grousers as well as required. So this allows you much better traction on the ice. Of course, most of these vehicles are diesel, so they have a preheat system. 
where they'll heat up the glow plugs, of course, to ensure that the engine will start. In theory, that should be very good. However, it's also good to have another vehicle that's running that could be used to slave, to assist in the startup if you're using too much power before the actual engine catches. Well, driving on roads in the winter, if the roads are identifiable, in other words, they have been cleared to some extent, there can be a lot of ice in places you don't expect. If you're in wheeled vehicles, it can be terrifying uh, because there are times when I was in uh, an AVGP for tactical reasons, we had stopped dead at a certain part of the road and we didn't realize at the time, but there was uh, ice there and the vehicle with a mind of its own started sliding sideways. So we had to wait for a five ton wrecker to come park somewhere to the front, pull us out of that situation. Driving in the winter in deep snow and deep cold requires patience, uh, some luck and a lot of preparation. We're back. And now I'm looking at the right camera in, in the break that told us we were looking at the wrong camera. Sorry about that, no offense. We see you. All right, so yeah, that's a list of problems that you don't get in Europe, I guess. Yeah, I mean, in Northern Europe, but in a museum environment where you operate the vehicles, um, you know, so we actually have to deal with some of those issues uh, of operating and obviously with the equipment that you wear. Oh, we have this, so we drive around in Iraq and uh, the, the tank heater in the M1 is incredibly good. But of course, it doesn't help me as a PC I'm sticking my top hat back. Yeah. So November the 1st, I remember that, November the 1st, 2004, first day of winter in, in some places like Ireland, uh, it, we, it, the temperature in Iraq just went boom, straight down. And we're driving along for about 10 minutes and it would stop, pull off to the side of the road. I'd take over security duty while the loader would get off and stand behind the tank. Because the tank's got a turbine engine, it's got the 1500 degrees Fahrenheit coming out at you. So you stand behind that for a minute or two to thaw out. Then he'd hop back into the uh, loader's hatch, I'd hop out, stand behind the exhaust, thaw out, get back in the TC's hatch and off we go for another 10 minutes. It, it was, uh, of course, my gunner and driver inside the tank, just wearing short sleeves, completely against regulation. Because the, the, the heater is a blast to heat at you. Well, at least when it works. I mean, yeah. If it works, yeah. If it's... Yeah, the, the other problem is that the, the heater will break down in October and the part to fix it will show up in April. It happens. But yeah, I, I, on and on though, I'm happy living in Texas. We like the variety up here. Yeah. <laughs> no, wait. So, Nick, in the tanks that you've had, do you have a boiling vessel? Yes and no. So there, there's this common misconception that American vehicles don't have a, a boiling vessel. Officially in American, it's called a ration water heater. A ration heater. And on the M1, it will be located down by the loader's feet. Now, for some reason, the Army has stopped issuing these things. So I, I run into a lot of M1 tankers and say, oh, we never had a, we never had a BV or a, a Russian heater in our tank. Well, yeah, it, the, the rack is still there. You look into a modern tank, the rack is still at well, the loader's feet, but it's, it's in the, there. It's in the parts manual. It's, it's in a parts manual. You can look up the NSN, and if it's still in the system, you can buy and buy. I think what I'm going to do is uh, just go to eBay. And, and buy the thing because they're showing up on eBay. I don't know why they're showing up on eBay, but they're showing up on eBay. That's crazy. I don't know you can get stuff like that on eBay. No, you, you can. You, of course, we use it for coffee, not tea, like the British. A cup of? A, 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 a cup of. Okay, well, I've, I'm definitely enjoying my coffee. But and the you know Canadian what? tankers drink a lot of coffee. It's not tea. So is it like the British that the, that the war stops at five in the afternoon? <laughs> and, and, and you brew up and then you start the war again at six? Canada is... Uh, you know, being a Commonwealth country, it, it's an interesting position With where we're Tim Hortons. Yeah, yeah, coffee, coffee is king in Canada, but you know, I'll, we're we're right between the United States of America, uh, Great Britain, and Europe. So you'll find a lot of commonalities in both, a, a unique mix of both, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, ways of doing things and British ways of doing things in one country, and sometimes parallel side by side. What are some uniquely Canadian holiday traditions? Well, I mean, like once again, it's going to feel like we drink a lot of eggnog around Christmas. Okay. Okay. We there's right, but then of course we have our weird uh, uh, Christmas flavored Timbits. Oh. I don't think I want to know. But okay. I want to know. Okay. 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 Like like those you know. Munchkins for those. Yeah, like you know the little donut holes or whatever they call them in the United States. Um, and you know we will have turkey dinner and sometimes ham some families uh, like fish 
But as, also because it's a multicultural country, we then have this mix of different traditions. So once again, we have our British traditions of our past, uh, we have American tradition influence, and all these different other cultures. Uh, so Christmas up here is many, many things. A lot of people say happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Christmas Pope. We did forget our Festivus for the rest of us. Uh, but what, do you have a Festivus pole at home? No. Yeah, me neither. I, I, I am not a decoration, but you, you notice I have removed the tie. I, I have. I, I, I am more of the half bad humbug sort of person. I'm, I'm not going to spoil the party for anybody else. Well, I mean, you had a choice, yeah. and now <laughs> we've got... Okay. Good. Okay. We're back, and I understand that we're going to break for lunch right here on the street with you because while we do not have a boiler boiling vessel a boiling vessel not currently in this vehicle Ra ration heater yeah we d we did not get it our ebay bid did not work out um we do have some mre we do or whatever the canadian version of an mre is call it so let's imps what's on the menu today individual meal pack yeah what, what do we got so here you got scalp we, potatoes and ham scalp oh. potatoes and ham so we're gonna get our ham christmas ham beans and wieners beans and what is that christmas Eve? sounds good beans and wieners are always good oh and hash browns and hash bacon. hash browns and bacon so a nice uh, canadian breakfast Okay, heating instructions. Place on open couch in pot of boiling water. Oh, so we do need the boiling vessel. Well, that, that, that's a bad start. <laughs> we do need the boiling vessel, but there's no water in it or plug for it. Okay, this is bringing our Christmas meal to a screeching halt right now, unless we want to eat cold ham. We, we get the full winter field experience. I know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, sorry you don't get to watch us uh, eat, eat our Christmas meal on the stream right now. You know, if we're going, if we're going to be festival, I'm going to turn on the train one. Let's see. Yes. So, I don't know if you know this, but the Chieftain loves a train. The, the, the term is ferroequinologist. Okay, fine. Okay, uh, that, that, that's enough. Yeah. That, that's enough. Well, let's kill this. Bah humbug. But, uh, no, I mean... You, you broke a track! There was a, there, there, there has been an incident. A slight uh, derailment. The, uh... Slight derailment, but <laughs> we're going to get back on track here. Yep. There are a ton of volunteers that have come out to help make sure that this production can happen. I understand that you have students that come, and they spend their PA days here, yep. and they spend uh, time learning here at the museum. Uh, about mechanics and everything that it does uh, that goes into keeping the museum intact. <laughs> I, I mean, the students, it's, uh, they're great, but they are getting school credit for being here and working at the museum. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. But they're very talented, yeah. And then the rest of the museum volunteers that have come out to uh, help us in the preparation of this Christmas special. So what, what, what does school credit actually do for you? I mean, we're, we're talking like secondary schoolers here, right? Uh, high school, yeah, what, we, whatever well, the university We have a program for secondary school, yeah, so high school. And uh, they actually get, just like if you were to take a math credit or an English credit or a gym credit, uh, they get a tank credit. No, but they actually get, they get a co-op, there's a co-op program okay. where we, have, we build a small team of, uh, team of students um, they get to work here for a semester at the museum, learn about military history, do all sorts of odd jobs. And uh, this season, uh, they got to help us with the Christmas special. Yeah. So, of course, uh, another advantage of having automotive trained labor is that, uh, well, you know, Santa's workshop where yeah. has, has, has a facility out here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, yeah. When, uh, you know, those, those tanks have to be ready to get under that tree for Christmas. And so there's got to be uh, Santa's helpers and a, and a tank workshop. You bet you didn't know that, but it, it is called the Great White North. Uh, so, <laughs> did you say is that, is that a badge of pride, or do you get offended when we call you the Great White North? No, no, we really appreciate it. We people, a lot of people think that it's always snowing up here, which is not true. It gets very hot. It gets up to forty uh, or fifty degrees Celsius uh, in certain times of the year. But no, we take it's a badge of pride. <laughs> okay, so Santa's workshop. So uh, we we sent a we sent a couple of cameras out. Yeah, and I understand that there were quite a few uh, tech support calls that have come in from parents just trying to get their tank to run or fit under the Christmas tree. So why don't we roll that video now, see what shenanigans they got into. I'm the Elf Sergeant Major at Santa's Tank Workshop. I'm in charge of production and tech support. 
We're having quite the candy cane of a year this year, but we have the right elves to job. What are you guys doing? Wake up, it's Christmas time. All the tools required for assembly, you'll find in the toolkit in the side bin of the hull. Where did you drop the 10 mil socket? In the engine compartment? Well, you'll never get that back. Please hold as I transfer you to the quartermaster for replacement. No, no, no. What are you taking us apart for right now? That goes there, this goes here. It has to be back together and on the sleigh within an hour. So you put it together and you still have three gears in the box. And they weren't in the instructions? Uh, why don't you try starting it and see if they were essential? Why is there two left side engine armor plates? Oh, I sure were. Ma'am, when you placed the order, there were several sizes in the description, including the presentation size. Of course, the extra large is not going to fit under the Christmas tree. What are you guys doing here? The transmission goes in with the engine attached. Step number 76. Read the manual. Sir, so you're saying that the track is coming loose? That it's almost falling off? Please hold one moment and I'll transfer you to our track tension specialist. What is the nature of the track tension emergency? Uh-huh. What, and you've loosened the locking nut? You are sure that there is grease in the grease gun? No, sir, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. Uh, yep. That wouldn't do it. Okay. No, between the second and third return rotors. About an inch. Goodbye. Yes, sir. Assembly is required. We've provided all of the tools that you need to put your tank together. Yes, and the engine needs to go into the engine bay of the tank. That's what the lifting gear is for to attach to the engine. Of course we didn't include the crane, that's sold separately. Sir, the road wheels won't fit. Obviously you need a bigger box than that for the wheel road wheel knobby. And what are you two doing? We can't send live ammunition to kids. Seven hundred and twelve tickets cleared today. We can do more. But holy tinsel, we have an emergency. And we're back. Wow, your elves are, they are something. They're quite productive volunteers, as I've told you. Uh, and I mean, it, you, you're starting with, you really ripped down some of the vehicles around here, or the elves have ripped down some of the vehicles around here for restoration work. Yeah, so there, there's uh, three large active res, uh, restorations going, but then just ongoing maintenance, like that Leopard 1 pack is out for maintenance. That has to be done um, for us every couple of years. 
All right, I think we're about running out of time. The, 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 the lads in Europe are giving us a budget of time, and we may have slightly overrun it, but... Outsider, the, welcome. Us? Who knew? The, the colonials are taking over again. <laughs> But, you know, on, on the note of the restoration, I mean, there are reasons that you're constantly maintaining and you do have your annual event. So I was hoping that maybe you could take a little time to tell the folks at home about a little bit about Aquino and some of the upcoming events that you have here at the museum later in 2024. So, you know, we've quickly talked about the tanks and the snow event. So in February, uh, we have winter warfare. Um, all of the 2024 season, you can now get tickets, uh, details, cool videos, some videos with these guys at uh, tankmuseum.ca. But Aquino Tank Weekend is gonna be in July this year, so about a month after Tank Fest. So there should be you know, a couple really busy, tanky months this summer. So um, you know, get tickets, get details, Tank Museum. What's important is .ca. Okay, I, I, I don't know if I'll make Winter Warfare. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I kind of like driving with my roof down and my convertible in, yeah. in, in February in Texas. It's like, yeah, I've got yeah. enough taste of winter this was a great trip but i'll be back in july our guys have fun but depending on the weather they don't it's not always enjoyable for the, the tankers okay <clears throat> well before we throw it back to the fellas in bobbington i did want to give a very big thank you to you jeremy and your awesome volunteers all the students everyone that helped make decorating this m577 and the rest of the hangar possible uh, they were awesome in the videos and it, it was just it's just like family when we come up so i'm always so glad when we have nick and i have the opportunity to come up to the ontario regiment museum so thank you for having us out and thank you to everyone that's out there watching right now um for joining us for the stream and of course for the volunteers that are actually literally out there watching us right now um nick did you have any oh hold on you think i didn't notice okay you think i didn't okay. notice okay Good. that that your second accessory has been removed. I am officially bestowing upon you a bag of coal. Okay, and there's coal in here, okay? Gonna burn it for heat? No, they're actually just rocks from outside, but let's pretend they're coal. And this is for you, the King of Bah Humbug. Enjoy that bag of coal, and I hope you can get it through security on the way home. Which stocking here belongs to Chief Dip? Oh, you think he has a stocking? I don't know put it on the hat. There you go. Alrighty, Chieftain. Yep. Any final words before we throw it back over, Scrooge? No, I don't. Hopefully you guys all out there have uh, learned a little bit more about what goes on up here in North America and the uh, the excellent museum that we have. Of course, we have other museums in North America, but uh, Ontario Regiment RCAC. No, I get that one right this time. Uh, it's a very unique, especially with all the vehicles that are drawn. So I, I love coming up here. Any Anytime you get to get inside or run around vehicles, whatever, it's... it's, it's I mean, there's we have string lights in here. They let us... Of all you guys... Okay. It was a lot of um, not everyone can do this, but thank you. All right. Okay. Anyway. Lads, I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and we shall now kick it back to Bombington, the Tank Museum. They don't like when we call it Bombington. The Tank Happy Museum, Bombington. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Right down Santa Claus Lane Vixen and Blitzen and all his reindeer are pulling on the reins Bells are ringing, children singing, all is merry and bright Hang your stockings and say your prayers, cause Santa Claus comes tonight Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane He's got a bag that is filled with toys for the boys and girls again. Hear those sleigh bells jingle jangle, what a beautiful sight. Jump in bed, cover up your head, Santa Claus comes tonight, tonight. Santa Claus comes tonight. Happy day, happy time. To the bells and chimes. Santa Claus comes your way today. Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. He doesn't care if 
kill rich or poor for he loves you just the same Santa knows that we're God's children that makes everything right fill your hearts with the Christmas cheer Santa Claus comes tonight tonight Santa Claus comes tonight Thank you very much once again, Victor Rose. I hope you all have a round of applause in the chat with me for that amazing song. I'm sure you all recognize Here Comes Santa Claus. So I want to go through, because many of you will start now claiming your drops, if you're on the Twitch chat, that we have ourselves for 90 minutes of watching 5 times 5 XB. We have the Light Mark Vickers IC. Then we have the Ashram Rex for 180 minutes. We have the One Premium Day, the T7 Combat Car, or the Lorraine 40T. All you have to do is make sure that you are watching, got your volume, actively participating, claim it when it's ready, and you will win one of those rewards at those times. Of course, next we have the Advent Calendar Giveaway. Many of you are looking forward to this as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm going to give you a couple more seconds so you can all make sure that you're typing in chat. Then we're going to pull randomly. <clears throat> Again, reach out to moderator, PM the official World of Tanks channel, and of course the tank using people. We haven't forgotten about you. There are people there making sure you've got giveaway codes as well. So for door number 13, we have got ourselves, let's click a roll for the name, the famous clicker, which anybody who's a World of Tanks player will know what that means. Uh, we have a VIP bonus, bonus code number two. <clears throat> Then we're going to have, again, make sure you PM somebody. We have, that is Cello. Door number 14 is going to have ourselves the VK4503. That's with 100% crew and a garage slot. Thank you very much and congratulations. Door number 15. Let's see what we have. A T14 with one large box. Congratulations on that one. And that one is going to go to Meanies. M-I-E-N-3-S, congratulations to you. Door 16, we have the M10 RBFM, congratulations to you as well. Let's click a roll. Uh, Ryko Cat 1, I think it is. We have a VIP bonus code, so congratulations. I don't know why I can't say bonus code again. It's a very long day. For door number 18, and the last one for this time around, we're gonna have one more after this. Keep watching, make sure you pay attention, is Cyprian, and that is the Dicamax tank. Congratulations and well done. Again, if you were just tuning in or you necessarily weren't listening that well, Make sure you just DM the official channel, World of Tanks. Make sure that you reach out to moderate if you can't. And the World of Tanks channel um, will hopefully have another one going on. The Tank Museum will have a giveaway for there. I'm going to make sure in my list I haven't forgot anything because it's been a epically long day. Yep, now I'm going to pass you back to Nick and Richard. We're going to have you with the next guest. And we're now joined by yet another special guest, and it's Mr. Jack Beckett from tankhistoria.com. Firstly, Jack, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank um, you, Richard. I realise it's way past your bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say anything, but yeah, it is. Perhaps you could kick us off by explaining to those that aren't aware what tankhistoria.com is. Uh, tankhistoria.com is uh, a tank website. It's an mag online magazine, technically. 
uh, and we discuss, we don't really cover much news actually, but we discover in depth articles uh, of all our favorite tanks, which of course is the T-34, of course is the best tank in World War II. Now, controversial. But true. <laughs> But it's my son who's the editor of Tank Historia, so I can't take all the glory for that. So he's like the tank geek freak, and I, I tend not to um, interfere too much with the content. And we're taking over the world, slowly. And I have to say, I mean, for those of you that, that don't subscribe, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, the stories that you managed to get, Jack, you must have... Thank you. I mean, your team, they seem to be everywhere. Well, it's not many of us, actually. We, we kind of... I think we're quite good at looking, you know, bigger than what we are, but we're just, we're just passionate and we, we cover a lot of ground. You know, I've been in the industry 20 years. Uh, 2005 was the first website I, I started, which was uh, HMVF, Historic Military Vehicle Forum. And it kind of grew from there. The passion just grew from there. Um, but because it's such a friendly, it's, it's, it's a small niche in a sense. Everybody knows everybody. Uh, and, I kind of feel that, it, and it goes back to the point of, with history, is that it often gets lost. And I think with the, the exciting thing about the digital world we live in now, is that when we had magazines and you just turn the page, and it usually ends up in the kitchen table, ends up in the bathroom, gets, you know, gets recycled, that history's gone. But the, the beauty of the digital world is that we can just do so much, so often, so quick, and cover, as you say, uh, all around the world with so much uh, content. It doesn't matter. We don't have to, we're not limited by 96 pages or whatever. So we know a lot of people. Uh, we'd like to know a lot more people because history is being lost out there. Uh, as you know, this week we uh, covered the news of uh, Mick Wilson finding those six DD tanks in India. Well, that's special stuff. And Mick's sort of like an Indiana Jones of the, the tank world. That's all out there. And we've got to keep finding that stuff, keep bringing it and putting it in front of people. And what we're fortunate enough with, Tank of stories that we can take a piece of information, piece of news, whatever you guys are doing, and put it in front of millions of people like that. Just gone, it's done. And it, that's the power of Tank of Story. And I know you're as excited about the FV 4005 as we are. Yeah, well, absolutely. It's, it's when on Tank of Story in the early days, Jesse covered it, and you know, it's got a different name that we can't pronounce, but you know, we can't say, it's, but it's pretty good. It'll work. <laughs> and um, whenever we needed traffic in the early days, we would put that particular story up and it would just redline on traffic. And then you guys and, uh, and Joe, and of course World of Tanks, um, are putting it on the map. It's, it's actually fun. And I think that's what we're lacking. I think we just got the same old stuff in the tank world. But I think in the next year or two, we've got so much coming on mm. from collectors, uh, from private collectors, from big collections like the Wheatcrofts collection. Uh, I think we're in the best position we've ever been in the tank world, historically. Mm. Where does your, I mean, you obviously are passionate about military history, Jack. Where does that all stem from? I and mean, what first got you the love of this? I like anybody who's passionate. You can be as passionate as you want about a telegraph pole. And if someone captures me about, with their passion, I may not know anything about the subject. It's just, I'm into telegraph poles all of a sudden. This guy's, or the lady's just teaching me or telling me about a really boring subject, but very passionate. Now, my, my passion came from when I was a kid, and uh, my gran uh, took me to Fishbourne Roman Palace, mm. and it was just sparked like that. So that history came from there. And I can remember being at the kitchen sink. I will get you to answer your question, mate. <laughs> I can remember being at the kitchen sink when I was about this tall, and I said to my mum, uh, the usual mum thing, what do you want to do when you're grown up? And I said, I want to be an archeologist. She went, you're a bit strange, aren't you? And I've never forgotten that. And I can remember getting into history because of Action Man, Airfix, usual thing. And the first grown man I ever saw cry was my grandfather when I asked him on D-Day about what he'd done on D-Day in his kitchen in Shedfield in Hampshire. And it was only a previous week or so I picked his medals out of the bin because I saw him go through his desk. He had kept his medals for 70 odd years, 60, 70 years. And there was some point coming up to that Tipping point, I can see them from in the bin. I took them, I grabbed them out of the bin. And that's really where it started. And I asked him about D-Day and he started to cry. Oh, tears, you know. Mm. That was it, we wouldn't talk about it. And it just came from there, just grew, grew from there. Did he ever open up about it? No. You never found out what he was, it was nope. part of that one? Only those strange, small snippets that he'd only speak about in front of, with my grand, but never on his own, one-to-one. -one. And my... Um, 
paternal grandfather, he was Royal Marine, captured mm. in Crete uh, by the Fulcher Mega and, and spent some, some bad times in prisoner war camps that I traced down last year in uh, um, Austria and Slovenia. Um, a good friend of mine, Gary Stern, is an author and restore, uh, researcher, found the camps he was in, so I went to see those. Mm. So it's like this onward going journey of the mm. time. So to answer your question, it's just, the passion is just history. I don't care what history it is. I particularly like this history, but I'm passionate about all history. Yeah. And, you know, as somebody who's keen to obviously mark D-Day, we, we've got the 80th anniversary coming up and I know you're responsible for a very unique event which takes place here in Dorset, in the countryside. Tell us a little bit more about uh, your armour and embarkation event. Yeah, it, it, it is special actually on lots of levels because it was a one-off back in 2010 where a good friend of mine, Jim Clark, who's a, a Sherman uh, owner, um, and he, 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 he must have entertained more people with his Sherman tank over the 20 years than anybody else I know. And we came up with this idea of, do you think we could ever put tanks on the road like they do in, in Mons in Belgium, tanks in town? And I said, well, yeah, let's give it a go. He just asked a question I, and I went to Dorchester town. They went, yeah. So we put this together in 2010, just winging it completely. And again in 2012, and then the team grew to uh, Adrian Scott, who's got the nice Sherman. Uh, he joined us in 2016. His good friends, Jackie and Graham Cole, they joined the team in 2016. And Jackie is like a headmistress. She keeps us all together. And Steve George, who jumped out of airplanes in World War II kit, he joined the team. And the World of Tanks actually sponsored us um, in 2016. So, the reason we do it is you can come to these places and you can mm. see a static, but to actually see this on the road, to see it, smell it, touch it, mm. it's unique. So what we have here is a, 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 like a really interesting collection of World War II vehicles, all in procession through the quiet country lanes of Dorset. But I guess that reflects Dorset's really interesting World War II history, right? The whole idea of it was to represent the build-up to D-Day in our county because, the, the, uh, of course, Portland and Weymouth were big embarkation ports for uh, Omaha. Mm. So we wanted to recreate this actual scene. And, in fact, we do go on the lanes that were used for uh, embarkation. So this is time travel, real-time travel. Mm. I have to say, I mean, I was lucky enough to spend a day with you once uh, during this. And especially there's a segment through Dorchester where it was, I mean, the atmosphere, not just amongst the people who were taking part in it, but the general public, it was oh. so well received, wasn't it? Yeah. In fact, 22, because normally we'd gone on the back of the um, carnival, so there's thousands of people in town and all the roads are shut off. But last time we had to do it all ourselves. And I can remember coming over Gray's Bridge, which is the first bridge you come into Dorchester from uh, Kingston Moor, hoping that we got these 300 people in 90, on 90 machines and in 90 machines. And I just cried like a baby because that relief and the queue, the, the, the five deep, and it's, we think about 6,000 people came to see us then. You say 90 vehicles were in there? Including yeah. the, the, the DRs, the bikers. Uh, oh, yeah. Next year, we'd go, we'd apply for the Guinness World Record, mm -hmm. for the amount of uh, privately owned armour on the roads. Uh, Does that need to be a certain number? What's the current? No, I, well, I'll find out next week, because mm. it takes three months for them to, to get back to you. Uh, but we've got, in theory, 15 tanks, 20 half tracks, uh, M8s, uh, we've got scout cars, it's, it's endless, so it's a monster, and it will be the last one. And it, you said that before. Yeah. You have said that before, Jack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it why, will. Why do, you, why do you feel it's the last one? Is it just, I mean, I can imagine that the, the organisation is, is incredible for something like this. Yeah, I can imagine the police, you know, they must have a few things to say about this. Yeah, of course, we sit there with the police and we go through all those plans, but we all do it for free. We're all busy, busy mm -hmm. people, we've got companies. It's a huge time hog. But not only that, it's the nice salute, I think, on the 80th. Yeah. Just yeah. to say thank yeah. you to, 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 to the memories. And that, I think, is a good time. You're only as good as your last album, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so it's a good time to go. So I say you're a local, a local man. You've obviously grown up around these parts. Do you remember your first visit to the Tank Museum? Mm, kind of. Kind I was of. this big. Mm -hmm. I was five. And I can remember coming through the old doors. Yeah. Uh, and it's, in actual fact, some of these halls still smell like that <laughs> oil and canvas type smell that you get. You can't. That yeah, smell it's, is it's just unique, isn't it? So that would have been about 72 mm -hmm. and been here ever since. And of course, I brought my son, Jesse, when he was five. Everybody seems to be five when they come to the Tank Museum. 
And now Jesse's gone on to, you know, to run the biggest tank website of its kind in the world. Mm. And it's like home. Yeah. You know, we've known each other for a long, long time. And oh, since the HMVF days. Yeah, exactly. And it is like home. And it's, it's to see what, since you guys have turned up and do what you do, it's just done this. It's just stunning. You know? And you all deserve the, um, you know, the success you've had with this. That's very kind of you to say so. So outside of A&E, Jack, what does 24 hold for you personally? Grow the sites. We have about six or seven sites. I'm really passionate about prehistory, so I'm focusing on that. Um, we've got plain historia, a, a medieval historia. So the company's growing, but I kind of want to give it over to Jesse just to... I'd like to go and do, stop being the boss man for five minutes and just well, go... You're retired, are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> just get back on my bike and just go to Europe and just go and see some... Yeah, I think history. for everybody watching, we should explain that your, your passion is, and I have to say that, you know, when I follow Jack, we, we, we speak quite frequently, actually, nowadays as well, but you also met with some of these socials that you're, you're travelling around the world, big motorbike fan, um, and that's obviously your, your personal passion. Yeah, I'm no good at mechanics, so I, I, I don't really know too much about motorbikes, but I like mine because it's the best in the world. <laughs> and I just like the freedom, and I'm a real pain in the backside to go, and I've got a Jeep or two, so we go out in Jeeps. Mm. Because I like history, I can just stop and look at a tree and question. I'm a nightmare to go out with. I mean, not as friends. I mean, not, I'm not asking you out, Nick or Richard. I'm saying <laughs> if you come out on the bike or something or the Jeep, it's because I see history everywhere mm. and I have to question it. Mm. I have to stop and think and work out why is that bend in that road, for example. I don't know if that's tragic or not, but I, I kind of like it. So, Jack, we have to ask, we've been asking a lot of members of staff what their favourite tank is. Do you have a favourite tank? Yeah, I've got to tell you, fellas, oh, I wasn't no. joking. It was a T-34. T-34? Yes. You weren't kidding? No. No, 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 no. I was serious. Not the Centurion? You can choose anything. No, I've said no, it I, think times. I think he's adamant there, Nick. No, T-34. Yeah. What, is, what is it about the T-34, then? That's, uh... I find it prehistoric mm -hmm. in the sense it was just functional. Mm -hmm. It didn't need to do anything except for go forward and do the damage it did. Mm -hmm. And I always feel it's like it, it does look like it's on a mission. Mm -hmm. Even stood still, it's leaning, kind of leaning forward. And it's just that basicness of it. And the fact that they just moved factories over the other side of the mountains within days or weeks. It's just... Phenomenal stuff. I know, I know it's odd, but that's, that's, that's it. Yeah. Jack, well, thank you very much for joining us. We wish you all the success with Tank thank Historia. You. Appreciate it. And with A&E, Armour and Embarkation yes. next year. Good luck with yeah, the Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll be here, so... Yes, we'll... you'll be calling into the Tank Museum, won't you? So yeah. we look forward so, to yeah, seeing So, yeah, I think it. for everybody watching, so it ends up, the route actually ends up... And we come to here for midday-ish, yep. uh, so the public can come and see me, uh, see the Tank of it, uh, <laughs> see uh, Armour and Embarkation. And then we convoy to uh, Dorchester, mm -hmm. uh, Weymouth Avenue, outside Brewery Square, which is shut off. And then everybody can come and see us and talk and ask questions and touch, smell, feel, actually. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you so much, Jack. Thank you. Fire! It's the Spirit Centre. <laughs> <laughs> Come feel up. <laughs> la, 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 la. It is the best time of the year to start playing World of Tanks. So we're now joined by Chris Copson, who you may recognise as one of our presenters for our YouTube channel. Chris, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Now, Chris, yeah, tell us a little bit more about what it is you've been doing for us here at the Tank Museum. Well, um, it was all pretty unexpected. About a year ago, um, I came to work to act as a presenter and researcher for YouTube. And uh, it's getting to the stage where it doesn't feel like I've done anything else, really. It's, uh, it's absolutely excellent. It's really good fun. I mean, this is my subject, like a lot of those guys out there. Um, and um, I'm paid to research and write and um, perform in front of the camera. I mean, what could be better? <laughs> now, uh, the subject of, you know, tank headgear is quite a big one in our area. There's a lot of fascination about what tank crew wear on their heads, isn't there? Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, it's, it's, when it comes down to the basics, a tank, and I don't need to tell you this, Richard, inside, it's a pretty unfriendly <coughs> environment. It's a big steel box. You get chucked about all over the place. You get bruised. And there are a plethora of things you can 
welt your head on. Mm. So headgear, protective headgear for tank crew has been absolutely vital ever since um, the get-go. Um, it doesn't need to be sophisticated, it doesn't need to be ballistic, you're not an, uh, an infantryman outside, nobody's shooting at you, hopefully you're protected by the tank armour, but it's effectively, it's a glorified bump cap. Mm -hmm. We have actually got some examples here uh, to just sort of run through. Yes. Um, the I army mean, does love a hat as well, doesn't it? It so. does, <laughs> yes. Uh, although I'd have to say some of these hats aren't really very special. So what's uh, this one then? This is the Looks earliest. Like a tortoise shell. It does, yeah. This is the earliest type of headgear worn by tank crew uh, in the First World War. Um, it is very simple. It's leather uh, with a liner. Um, it would have a chin strap. That's disappeared over the course of the last hundred years. But you know, it does the job. Um, the problem with it, the reason the crew really didn't like these, you get out of your tank. This bears a resemblance to a German Stahlhelm. And frankly, getting slotted by your own side ain't a good way to go, is it? It'd be a bit disappointing, really. So Absolutely. your tank breaks down in no man's land, you're trying to crawl back to your own trenches and you get mistaken for the enemy. That wouldn't be a yeah, good... Not great at all. Um, I mean, most of these, these are very rare. I suspect that's because most of them ended up in a ditch in France. <laughs> the same with, they, uh, people will have seen, they actually produced a... Um, a leather and chain mail face mask. Mm. Um, they were supposed to protect you from bullet fragments, what we call splash and spore coming through. Um, but those tanks, I mean, you're very sweaty inside. It's, the temperature's high. The thing keeps slipping down. They get thrown in a ditch as well. Mm. So uh, that is, that's what we started off with. So why didn't they just wear the standard, you know, the, well, the Brody helmet, wasn't it, that the uh, infantry were wearing? That's your Brody helmet. I mean, that does the job. Um, if you're in a trench, I mean, it will stop things like shrapnel balls, splinters, things like that. Um, it's designed to stop fire from above. The problem is you're wearing that in a tank. You go and peer through a vision slit or a periscope, you're going to hit the brim mm, right. and it'll knock it off your head. So these things really weren't up to the job. So those were no good. The leather helmets weren't very popular. So in yeah. practice, what, you know, what did the crews in the First World War use to protect their heads? Because primarily that's what this is all about. I think probably just woolen caps. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody remembers the, uh, the comfy cap, the mm. thing that doubles as a scarf mm. and, uh, and headgear. I mean, that will stop the worst of it. After the war, the tank corps gets a bit more, um, they start to think about, well, you know, what can we wear? What will make our core distinctive? And during the war, they'd been in contact with French troops, the Chasseurs Alpins particularly, uh, who were wearing berets, okay. like French peasant berets. And they thought, well, this is a good idea. I'm very pleased with this, Chris. Absolutely. <laughs> Would you like coming to try home? it on, Richard? It's like coming so. home. <laughs> That is, this one's dated 1942. So 1942, that's slightly cool. before I joined the regiment, I with, have to say. Uh, but only um, slightly. And probably quite large as well. With oh, I don't know, it's going to fit me. That's going to be terrible, isn't it? With so original it's, moth. it's quite <laughs> large, isn't it? And again, you know, this, yeah. is, this is a real sort of, for the, for the British Army at that time, Can't to be adopting a very sort of unique form of headdress. And yeah. that, that's, that's what the Army gets, you know, it's so important for them to have this kind of unique style, I suppose. Each regiment, Absolutely. isn't it, likes yeah. to have its own... I mean, the, the tank court were new. Mm. Eventually they evolved into the Royal Tank Regiment and the Black Beret has been the symbol mm. of our regiment ever since. Um, they are a bit different these days. Uh, that one will uh, cheerfully uh, keep it's, some it of your shoulders. It seems to have a very long, yeah, it seems to be very long. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a modern that's, that's beret. That's more, yeah, more. Um, well, if you hold the two up, you can see the sort of uh, difference in size. They've, uh, they've shrunk a little bit. Yeah. Um, but still the same Tank Corps badge, Fear Nord. So, so they weren't universally popular, were they? And there were some sort of rather unflattering comparisons made between, you know, officers um, wearing these. And there's a rather famous punch cartoon yeah. of uh, a tank corps officer in the street looking very smart. Next to him is a fairly disreputable looking French onion seller. So, <laughs> so, yeah. But now there isn't really hardly a regiment in the British Army that doesn't have the That's beret. That's the thing, it caught on. Mm. There isn't an army in the world that doesn't wear the beret. Yeah. So the French, Chasseurs Alpins started it, the RTR took it on, and now everybody, every army in the world, wears the beret as a simple 
practical piece of headgear. And the cap, the cap badge is, you know, it's very, um, I mean, obviously there are certain, like everything, military regulations, you know, cap badge had to be over your left eye. Um, there was, at one stage, it was referred to as the tanky berry, wasn't it, where it's sort of like down on both sides? Um, purely because obviously not yeah. wearing Tanks, helmets, you know, the, like that. Yes, yeah, yeah, the headsets yeah, yeah, yeah. on and that. Yeah. But yeah, and we used to spend a lot of time shaping berries. It sounds odd, mm. um, but so you get issues, you need berry, and then you'd have this, you go through this whole process of making it you know, look really smart. Right. You put in hot water, cold water, hot water. I mean, as Chris obviously has probably done with yep. his own berry. Oh yes, <laughs> wear it in the bath. Uh, not wear it in the bath, but you have to get the thing wet and then go and watch a film. Let it dry off on your head. That way it actually moulds itself to the shape of your head. Up to that point, you get sort of, uh, cool, blimey lad, I could land a helicopter on that because mm. it looks like a big felt mushroom. Yeah, it looks terrible. So everybody, yeah, everybody, yeah it was obviously, and, and you know, leather, a leather band as well was quite, because you weren't actually, I don't know if you are now, but they, we weren't issued with leather bands. You'd have to buy it yourself, believe it or not, yeah. um, you know, bury with a leather band. That is, that's mine. That's my, that's your my private one. purchase uh, once. <laughs> I was going to say, it's very well shaped. Thank you so much. <laughs> From a professional. <laughs> so we got one more to look at. It's the uh, also a packed one, which is a very different approach, moving well, away from the British Army altogether. This is a totally practical tank helmet. This is Warsaw Pact, probably 1960s, 1970s, and everything is built in. I mean, it is, it's a bit like a flying helmet, but it's got these big padded ribs across the top, buffer on the front, internal headphones, and then the really neat thing, and I think they possibly inherited this from the Luftwaffe, um, it's got a throat mic. How does that work? So that sits either side of the badly. Mic, <laughs> quite badly. <laughs> but the idea is it's a clever little piece of kit because it picks up the vibration from your throat. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you speak, it turns it into recognisable speech just by the vibration. Obviously, that's a good idea if you're in an aeroplane because you need to wear an oxygen mask. In a tank, it means it drowns out some of the noise. And I mean, we all know tea tanks are pretty damn noisy things anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the winter weight. Um, I had light cotton ones for summer. This one's fleece line, so it's a, uh, that's a winter weight, also packed tank helmet. Um, the problem with it, of course, is you have to plug that in. Right, and but it's all one piece. It's all one piece, but the number of times you've climbed out of a turret, and left that plugged in, I was gonna say. you just about <laughs> jerk, jerk your head off your shoulders. So, so uh, yeah. Brilliant. Chris, well, thank you very much for joining us and, and, and sharing that. Best time of the year to start playing World of Tanks. So we're joined now by uh, Paul Famajuro, who some of you may recognise as Fam the Tank Man. And Paul, Paul, you're our uh, content creator. So tell us a little bit about what that entails. So essentially what I do is I make short videos for the Tank Museum social media, uh, such as Facebook, Instagram and all that. But one of the main things I manage is the Tank Museum's TikTok account, which goes by the name Fam the Tank Man, rather than the Tank Museum. So, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Uh, what, where does your passion come from for this? Because I have to say that, you know, the first time I started watching them, and I'm of a certain age where, you know, TikTok's are still a bit of a, a mystery to me. Uh, my children, David's laughing at me over there again. <laughs> Silly old fool. Um, but, I mean, where did the passion for certainly utilising it? I mean, obviously, when you present, you know, Paul, if I may say, they're absolutely amazing. And the information Thank that you. you can fit into in that, you know, sort of soundbite is quite incredible. So where did that passion come from? So I've always been interested in uh, military history. I mainly started with, like, war movies, I think, like, Memphis Bell, uh, stuff like that. Um, but a few years back, I discovered that I actually quite like making content for social media uh, on my own personal TikTok account where I do stuff about, like, motorbikes and stuff like that. Um, and then I thought it would be so cool if the Tank Museum had a TikTok account where we'd make really cool content about, uh, well, tanks, military history, and the people that serve in them. So, yeah, and I think we're doing a decent, I think I'm doing an all right job so far. We, we all think um, it's Touch brilliant. wood. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I really enjoy the work. It's, uh, it's really great uh, being able to work around like such iconic pieces of military history. And not only that, but be able to make like entertaining, funny, and informative um, videos uh, for our audiences online. 
And um, I know sometimes think like, oh, it's all TikTok, oh, it's a bit weird, blah, blah. No, we, we do good <laughs> stuff. We've got no, nothing, nothing cringe like twerking or anything like that. Just good quality content. No funky dances yeah. from the Tank Museum. Maybe, out, maybe, later, we'll yeah. maybe later. Maybe later, maybe <laughs> later. Right. So, yeah, so as somebody who's very much enmeshed in the world of historical content creation, I mean, perhaps, you know, do you have any favourites? Are there any content creators you would recommend? There's quite a few um, content creators that make well, military history related stuff, um, especially some who have uh, kind of like a niche within a niche, uh, which we'll have on screen in a sec. Uh, one of my favourites is a guy called Tanny Tank, who's based in the United States, and his niche is uh, remote control tanks, but he'll do the same thing. He'll make like interesting, entertaining, funny videos using his vast collection of uh, remote control tanks and stuff like that, which is really, really cool. Um, we have done a little bit of a collab in the past. I'm um, hoping to do another one uh, soon in the future as well. Um, but yeah, so. I think he's coming up next. He should be coming he? up next. Yes, we're still looking at our stuff at the moment, which is great. But yeah. <laughs> but you started as a guide, didn't you? You know, so uh, your your, uh, your 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 knowledge and, and, and sort of expertise is. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I've, well, I've been here for just over five years now. So as you said, started as a guide for about three years, which allowed me to get a lot of my skills uh, in terms of presenting and stuff like that. Um, and then gradually ended up in the position I am now. And here's Tanny Tank. So these are some of your favorites. Paul, there we yeah. go. So yes, we have Tanny Tank, a really, really good guy. Uh, makes really, really entertaining, really funny content. Uh, he puts a lot of effort into his videos. Um, anytime he comes up on my For You page, stuff like that, always puts a smile on my face. Um, here we've got Brawldozer. He does uh, some really good content as well. He's also infamous for his um, Vape 9 Koenig's Tiger meme. Um, he also is a reenactor as well. He's got a vast collection of like mostly German stuff. He likes his um, German history, uh, and he also works a lot with the the Overloon Museum as well. Um, so I definitely recommend checking out his content as well. Really, really entertaining guy. Um, but yeah, so um, we'll have a few others in a sec. Uh, here we've got uh, Ballistic Fun. So he, again, military history, but his focus is he makes uh, animated videos, I think in Blender. I could be wrong, but I think it's in Blender. Uh, he does everything is himself. He does the modeling himself. Um, and it's just really, really cool to see, again, another person put this much effort into making content like that. Um, Sometimes it's like cool, like oh, like based on scenarios, like oh, what if this tank got hit by this? Or sometimes you just get the really weird stuff, like what if you were to crush a tank with a 500-ton hydraulic press? <laughs> um, why not? But yeah, why not? Um, yes, um, this is World War Wisdom. Um, he is also a reenactor. He does a lot of content in the style of like um, tank, tri well, not just tank, but um, military history trivia. He does quite a bit of myth busting as well, which is really cool because always good to get rid of misinformation and stuff like that. Um, his, yeah, his videos are really quite entertaining as well, so definitely worth checking them out. And finally here, we've also got Yarn Hub, who do some really, really great content. Basically animated videos of historical events. Um, they also have worked very closely recently with Sabaton, which are also freaking awesome. And fans. I can see you're a Sabaton fan. Yes, and we've yes. got some Sabaton some, yeah. coming yeah. up later on today. You'll be awesome, pleased awesome. to hear. Good stuff, good stuff. And fam, yeah. you're making your YouTube debut, aren't you, next? Friday on the Tank Museum's YouTube channel. Yes, that'll be an experience, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 What's, but, uh, can you tell us a bit about the video? That's so coming? we're doing a new series called Tank vs. Tank. Um, it's going to be on Panzer III versus Char B1 Bis, uh, focusing on uh, the invasion of France and how a much bigger, heavily armoured tank uh, didn't perform as well as a smaller, less armoured, but more manoeuvrable tank. And we're going to go into the details of exactly why they did better than the, uh, uh, the French armour. But yeah, I think I, it, I've watched it. It looks really good. I'm a bit biased, so I'll let you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you guys. And when can we expect to see the first episode? Uh, I think next, it's Friday. next Friday. Next Friday. Next Friday. Yeah. Friday. So yeah, grab your popcorn and your tea and all that. Yeah. Wow. Well so, done. Thank, thank you. you. You're absolutely killing it on YouTube. As the, I'm sorry, on TikTok, as thank the you. kids say. So, yeah. as, as, the, the kid, as the kids say, say yeah. <laughs> uh, the kids will say it is lit. So there we go. <laughs> um, but yeah. So yeah, there we go. Hey, great. Well, internet gold. And yeah. now for some real internet gold. Uh, oh, yeah, so we did ask all of our community to send in your pets with wonderful festive outfits and everything else. We did ask for a horse with a hat, but... I'm sorry I let you down. ...we haven't to quite deliver. But here is the video clip with all of our community pets in action.
Thank you once again and for the final time to Victor Rolls who did an amazing job with those amazing songs and that was of course Rock Around the Christmas Tree. Thank you so much and I hope you have a safe journey home and thank you for entertaining our audience with those amazing songs. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So this is the last chance that we're going to do a giveaway so I'm going to give you plenty of time to type into the chat Spam Away, Dino Dance and the Songing. Everybody was dancing and singing in chat with you. Um, for the Tank Museum, this is a chance for the Tank Museum staff to be giving away plenty of codes for you as well. It is Advent time. We do have our Holiday Ops event going on right now where you can take part in Vinnie Jones' missions, cats, dogs, play your tanks, open boxes, and do lots of cool things inside World of Tanks. So let's get right to it with the first winner who is going to be, is it that hard to do? Sometimes you wouldn't believe. Um, so the code that is it that hard to do has won this time is the LT432. All you have to do is reach out to a moderator or ping the official World of Tans Tanks channel and we will give you your code and reward later. We have five more to go. So day 20, and they said nice, you are welcome, is going to go to uh, Shockwave. I know Shockwave. Congratulations and well done. You win yourself a Super Pershing, so congratulations. Thank you very much. You know what to do to claim your reward. I know I'm not wearing the Santa hat this time. It's very warm in this sweater uh, that's going on. It's a very warm day today. Yeah, everybody was asking for more Christmas sweater pictures and scenes. Here we go with Starisvat. Starisvat, you have won the SDRV M-42. Congratulations. Remember, all you got to do is ping a moderator or ping the channel. I know a lot of people are asking right now, Eek, please pick me. It's not up to me, it's up to the random person who's gonna pick the channel. So the next person is going to be HF underscore Wolf. You've won four large boxes. Congratulations and well done. Sorry, two more to go. So we've got day 23. Let's see who's won this one. I'm not even gonna try and pronounce that, uh, Fendi. Uh, Fendi, you've won a Type 64. You know who you are. You've been pinged in chat. Um, congratulations and well done. Everybody in chat is now laughing at the name that was just put one. And then finally, we have Vraz underscore. Congratulations and well done. You have won yourself four large boxes as well. So on the 24th, you've won four large boxes. Congratulations. That was our last Advent giveaway. It was the last song from the Victor Rolls. But next up, that's not all, we have guest museum segments, but not just museums, friends of the museum, friends of World of Tanks, who are gonna go through some of their museum and organization collections. Welcome to Sweden and our museum, Arsenalen, located one hour drive west of Stockholm. In this museum, we have a well unique collection of tanks, armored fighting vehicles and other military vehicles that you cannot find anywhere else on the planet. What I would like for Christmas is some more space because in the collection we have a number of vehicles that we cannot show them to the public because we don't have the space enough. Like this one, a Swedish heavy tank project developed in the early 1950s. This vehicle became world famous through the game World of Tanks, where it has become an uh, iconic vehicle, the KRV, a super heavy automatic loaded main battle tank that was supposed to be the future in the Swedish army. But the project was cancelled in the mid-late 1950s and Actually, this is the remains from that tank. Or this one, the XX-20, a Swedish 
futuristic tank design from the late 1970s with an articulated chassis with engine at the rear, crew compartment at the front and a gun mounted on top of it. A 120 millimeter gun was supposed to be used. They tested this vehicle a lot all over Sweden, also fired with it before the cancel then finally were stopped and project closed. Or this one, the combat vehicle for the future, developed by BAE Heglunds more than 20 years ago. This is an all-electric vehicle developed back then with two small diesel engine powering generators providing electricity for the motors in each wheel station. This was a project for the future, but the world they were not ready back then, so the project was cancelled. It was too far ahead, and we have both the tracked and the wheeled version. So if we had some more space, we could show you these vehicles and more. But while waiting, we will provide you with information on our social media. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, and we will give you a lot of information about these vehicles and what we have in the collection. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year! And a massive thank you to Stefan there, our friend from the Swedish Tank Museum. And now we're going over to Belgium and the War Heritage Institute. Hi, I'm Robbie. Hello, I'm Ben, and welcome to the Royal Military Museum here in Brussels. The Royal Military Museum is part of the Belgian War Heritage Institute, which is a federal organization for military heritage and commemoration. Here in our museum in Brussels, you can discover amazing exhibits, such as these medieval arms and armor, magnificent 19th century uniforms, artillery from all ages. You can also see a beautiful collection of planes from the First World War, to the modern jets in our aviation hall. But of course, we know that is not what you guys are tuned in here for today. And that is why we want to take you to Pierre Muller, who is our tank collection manager, who is in. Let's start. The reward is to if too much because the next goes all of them in one location. Here in Bastogne, it's the picture of the Super Bowl. In Bastogne Barracks, there are two. First, I was the Battle of the Birth, and the second, I was the Armored Warfare during the Second War. But we have also vehicles in Brussels and also in Nebraska, in the future, in Utah. Bastogne Barracks is not only a museum, it's also one vehicle restoration center. In this center, some workers are working on hundreds of vehicles about the Second World War. Here we have a ESV, one higher AV armored car, and two Germans. Much of the collection is kept in working condition, such as a unique assembly of Sherman variants. Russian heavy tanks as the JS-3 and ISU-152. But also other types of vehicles such as the school M3 Grant, newly restored. To show you the big collection, we will organize a small convention on the tanks and we also will release a book about mechanized warfare. Yeah. And in 24, for the anniversary of the Battle of the Burge, we have a big surprise for you. Of 
friends at Bonkum asked us what we'd like for all Christmas presents here at Ben's Store. We were long and hard about this and determined that we'd like a new Christmas coat, well, I mean, a proper paint job, for all Panzer and the Fieldswagen 4 most fully built. This command version of the Panzer IV tank contains additional radio and surveillance equipment. It was made at the Nibelungenwerke plant in Austria in September 1944 and captured by American forces in Belgium, who shipped it overseas for study and display at the Aberdeen US Ordnance Museum. Later, it was returned to the study collection of the German army at Koblenz. Through partnership with this organization, we are able to display this unique vehicle, the last survivor of only 17 produced. While the current camouflage scheme is historically incorrect, it has seen worse days since it arrived in Brussels in Finnish colors and markings for unknown reason. So please Santa, give us the courage, a steady hand and the correct wall paint coats to restore this vehicle. If anyone has a spare carburetor for our Sturmgeschutz 3 Ausführung F8, give us a shout. Rolle Kerstfeest! Joyeux Noël! Merry Christmas from the War Heritage Institute! Well, what a fantastic collection they've got over there. So thank you very much to our friends over there thank you. in Brussels. And now we're going to go straight over to catch up with one wreck of the French Foreign Legion. Bonjour à vous tous, World of Tanks. Je suis le maréchal de logis Paul, chef d'engin Jaguar au 1er Régiment étranger de cavalerie. Bienvenue ici, dans l'Est de la France, où nous participons actuellement à un exercice organisé par la 6e Brigade Légère Blindée avec nos Jaguars. Le Jaguar, nouveau blindé de l'armée française, qui succède à la MX-10 RC que vous avez pu découvrir en 2021 et 2022 avec World of Tanks. Ce blindé, mesurant 3,6 m pour une longueur de 7,1 m et un poids total de 28 tonnes. Un équipage de 3 personnes composé d'un tireur, son chef d'engin à sa gauche et le pilote. Les caractéristiques, on peut observer un canon de 40 mm équipé également d'un poste MMP pour pouvoir effectuer des tirs sur cible à plus de 4 km. Également de peau fumigène pour pouvoir s'extraire de toute situation compliquée par un masque de fumée et une mitrailleuse 762 permettant d'effectuer également en simultané des tirs au canon de 40 mm et à la 762 en 360. Le pilote, grâce à ses caméras infrarouges et bas niveau de lumière, peut rouler tout le temps et l'équipage, tout en étant embarqué, peut, grâce à ses caméras latérales, observer en 360 autour de l'engin. Possédant un moteur de 500 chevaux et 6 roues motrices et une autonomie de 800 km, le Jaguar peut rouler jusqu'à 70 km h sur tous les terrains et 90 km h sur route. Nous voici maintenant dans le Jaguar, à ma place de chef d'engin, à ma gauche le tireur. Vous pouvez voir beaucoup d'écrans et de capteurs permettant l'observation, le tir et la communication avec tous les autres Jaguars. En petit bonus, on possède aussi la climatisation et le chauffage. Nous voici maintenant sur le toit, au plus près de la 762, complémentaire au canon de 40 mm. Pour moi, en tant que chef d'engin, le Jaguar est rapide, mobile et très efficace, pouvant évoluer sur tout type de terrain, avec une capacité d'à peu près 150 obus. Il peut tirer au coup par coup ou en rafale très précisément. Voilà pour la présentation du Jaguar qui équipera bientôt les autres régiments de l'armée française et moi qui espère le retrouver en tant que joueur dans World of Tanks. Je vous souhaite à tous un joyeux Noël de la part des légionnaires du 1er Régiment étranger de cavalerie. Thank you once again for amazing content from the one wreck of the French Foreign Legion. Next up, we have Drive Tanks in Texas. Hi everyone, this is Brandon Riley over at drivetanks.com. We are a living history museum based out of Uvalde, Texas, or just down in the South Texas area near San Antonio. But we actually let people come out, drive tanks, shoot the artillery, machine guns, flamethrowers, RPGs. We are currently at, I think, 17 tanks in total, 
potentially, um, well, not potentially, moving up to 18 once we get our newest acquisition in. But not only do you get to drive the tanks, we're also firing actual projectiles out of the tanks. So ranging from anywhere 12 to 15 pounds solid steel projectiles out of our Sherman or the Pac-40. We have uh, our, several artillery pieces like the 105 Palace, Russian 20, tank-wise, stuff ranging from our Sherman EZ-8 up to the T-72 and the levers that we see on the battlefield today. So in all of its functions, when we drive it, most of them have live guns. We're still working on getting a live leopard. That'll be fantastic. But holiday tradition-wise, we are work currently working on getting our Sherman decorated up with the Christmas lights and getting ready for that whole photo shoot to take place. And new hardware. We're always looking out for new tanks, but not only to drive, but also to shoot. And we don't like doing blank charges because that's not what people come to us for. So it's tanks like Centurions or even a Leopard with a live breach block would be absolutely fantastic. So other than that, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, and y'all have a good one. A massive thank you to Drive Tanks in Texas, once described to me as Disneyland for tank enthusiasts. But there okay, you go. I can see why. <laughs> and now we're going to go over to the Canadian War Museum. Today we are presenting a special piece from our collection. Our collection contains hundreds of thousands of objects, including medals, uniforms, works of art, and rare military vehicles. We hope that this glimpse into our work will spark your interest in the Canadian War Museum. On behalf of the museum, happy holidays. The vehicle behind me is an M4A2 HVSS 76 millimeter wet Sherman tank. This is a great piece that we just acquired recently. The HVSS means it has the older horizontal volute spring suspension as opposed to the vertical which were on the earlier Sherman tanks. Now the suspension between the vertical volute and the horizontal is a lot different. It's a lot bigger on the HVSS. The M4A2 the A2 tells you it's a twin 671 diesel engines. The difference is the bigger suspension and the upgrade. So on the, the ones being used by Canada during the Second World War, they were 75 millimeters. These are 76 millimeters, and the wet tells you that the ammunition was stored in bins protected by water. So it mechanically, it's the same tank, it's just bigger. After the life of the, these particular Shermans in the Canadian Armour Corps, they do get retired and distributed. The Royal Canadian Armour Corps are very proud of who they are, so therefore it is a good piece that, to recognize regimental armories and legions and sit out front. The ones that you see throughout Canada are these ones, the M4A2s. The fascinating part with this particular one and why we're so excited to have it is that it is still marked up, although looks more like someone threw a can of paint at it, the bucking horse of the 14th Canadian Hussars. Now the interesting thing there is the 14th Canadian Hussars left the Armour Corps, or moved out of the Armour Corps in 1968. So this vehicle has maintained its markings since that time. So this particular vehicle will be fully restored to operating conditions, meaning that every nut and bolt will come apart, be cleaned, and be put back together to make a complete operating vehicle. And the markings for the 14th Canadian Hussars will be put back onto it.
Well, thank you to our Canadian friends and to all the museums who have uh, sent us videos. But finally, we've got the regiment of which the Tank Museum represents and a very important regiment to you. <laughs> of course, not that I'm biased. We now have <laughs> the Royal Tank Regiment. So the Royal Tank Regiment, despite its name, is equipped with a lot more vehicles than just tanks. Clearly, our primary vehicle is the Challenger 2 main battle tank. Uh, we've had that for around two decades now uh, and are looking forward to, in the future, gaining Challenger 3, uh, which should be a great uplift in the firepower for the British Army. And having seen various plans for it, uh, it's very exciting stuff for the regiment. Uh, alongside the Challenger 2, we've also got the Warrior Infantry Fighting Vehicle, and we use that with our recce troops uh, ahead of the main body. Uh, and back in the headquarters, we've also got the Bulldog 2 armoured personnel carrier. And something that flies around uh, and merges a lot of these different platforms together are our new remote piloted autonomous systems, or UAS. Uh, so we use them quite a lot in our recce troop to be able to feed back into the headquarters uh, and support our ability to fight the battle. When we're dismounted, we use the SAAT A2, uh, but mostly amongst the tank crews, we use the carbine variant of that and spread amongst our recce troop, we've also got sniper pairs uh, and we've got sharpshooter rifles. So all uh, merged together is quite a potent beast uh, across. So this year, it's 100 years since the Tank Corps became the Royal Tank Corps and gained its royal status. So we had a drumhead service here in Tidworth with the Lord Lieutenant uh, and then subsequently followed on to our Cambrai Day celebrations. So that starts in the morning with gunfire uh, and that's when the officers and the seniors of the regiment serve rum and tea mixed together to the soldiers. So this represents H hour, which was the start of the Battle of Cambrai uh, back in 1917. We then move forwards to the Cambrai final for the, uh, for the football match uh, and that's between the two squadrons who have moved through the quarters, semi-finals uh, and that determines who the best sporting uh, squadron is of the year. Uh, after that we had another uh, element where the officers and the seniors served the soldiers uh, Christmas dinner uh, and that combines with the Cambrai dinner and Christmas dinner to say thanks very much for all their hard work. Uh, this year it was on the tank park uh, and thankfully they recorded the food fight uh, which made it into the Daily Mail which was great morale for all of the guys. And straight after that, it's a quick change parade uh, over to the boxing, uh, and that's when the regiment have 10 bouts of interregimental boxing, which again is great for camaraderie uh, and allows a good social event throughout the evening. Hi, I'm W1 Williamson, the regimental sergeant major of the Royal Tank Regiment and the senior soldier in the regiment. I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas on behalf of myself and the regiment. And in the run up to Christmas, we'll be conducting a number of activities, such as serving the soldiers a festive meal, conducting some mess functions, CO's Christmas PT and finishing up with the officers and sergeants mess going toe-to-toe -to -toe on the football field. So the Christmas festive period is a very busy time for us but as all good uh, British Army regiments we managed to fit in a good amount of cohesion. So two big events that we look forward to are the commanding officers Christmas PT session and that usually involves lots of running around in Christmas hats and fancy dress and eating lots of mince pies whilst trying to keep them down on the subsequent sprint sessions afterwards. We've also got the officers to seniors football, which is a yearly competition. Clearly the seniors have a little bit more expertise. I think sometimes the officers fitness and uh, tenacity pulls us through. Uh, we haven't won in any of the years that I've been at the regiment, but hopefully next year, that's always the thought. 
So Merry Christmas from everyone at the Royal Tank Regiment. We hope you have a fantastic festive period and a Happy New Year. And many thanks, of course, to the Royal Tank Regiment for taking time out of their busy schedule at the moment to do that. Now, from heavy metal to heavy metal. You've been waiting all evening to say that, haven't you? And, and, and <laughs> George, okay. So earlier, we were able to catch up with Parsons from bass player of the historical, legendary Swedish heavy metal band Sabaton. So for those who are unfamiliar with the band, haven't come across them before, here's a look at what they do. So we put some of the uh, questions from our community to Par earlier on, and uh, the first question you asked him was, where does your fascination for history come from? So I'm Par from Sabaton, and uh, we have been singing about military history for about two decades now. And uh, I wouldn't say that we have a total fascination about it, but I would say that we do have a deep interest for it, and uh, we have been doing it for now 20 years out of our 25 year career. And it started with the idea that we wanted to sing about something that really matters, something that was taken out of the real world, something that was important. And when we looked at the different topics that we had at hand, military history seemed to the most interesting that we thought of. We, we know that we are not the first band that we have ever sang about this, definitely not, but it suits us very well. And it suits to the heavy metal genre pretty well. So, um, and after doing our first record with it, our fans would not forgive us if we would change our career path. We hope you appreciated the question and the answer. The next that was asked was, what inspired them to form a band which sings all about history? Um, the band was actually formed way before we had the idea of singing about military history and conflicts. The band was just formed as an idea to, to just have fun and play heavy metal, which we all love. And uh, later, when we, after we realized that lyrics was a necessary evil, as we call it in the beginning, in the first period of our career, where we just sang about anything. But after we changed to military history, lyrics actually started to matter. And uh, I think that's when we kind of figure out who we are and what we are doing and what we will be doing in the future. And the next question from the community, what was the first historical metal song you wrote and what was it about? The first historical metal song that we ever wrote was Primo Vitoria. And uh, it is about uh, the landing uh, on D-Day at Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944. And uh, we were inspired by the movie Saving Private Ryan, which we were watching in the evening. And we had the music recorded for Prima Victoria. And we were uh, sitting in the night uh, thinking about, okay, we just wrote an epic song. We need an epic tale or something to tell about it. And we watched that and we're like, wow, this is probably one of the most epic moments in human history when it comes to military history. So this would be a perfect thing to include. And that's where we wrote our first song about military history. And then we thought, OK, this was pretty good. Let's continue. And then we asked, what does Sabaton actually mean? The meaning of Sabaton, um, Sabaton is a word, it's a name, is a sort of a medieval armor that the knights were using on their foot to protect themselves for being beaten on the foot. We see it more as a, uh, this is a heavy metal piece of armor. And uh, yeah, if you would kick somebody with it, it's a heavy metal kick. And we thought that that would be kind of suitable for a metal band. What has the highlights? And after a visit to the museum, they were asked what did they think about it and what most surprised them about their visit? I was recently visiting uh, the tank museum uh, and uh, after a very long time, because I've been looking forward to come there for many years after my first invitation there. Now I was there and I was totally uh, overwhelmed by how exciting the whole exhibition is, how exciting the museum is, and uh, 
how well run it is, the people who work there, the passion that you feel. You walk into the building and you feel like immediately, uh, wow, there's a spirit here. And uh, I, I was, I got that spirit. So now I'm carrying a little bit of that spirit. And uh, yeah, it's a su super place to be. And the last question from the community, uh, what has been the highlights of 2023 for yourself and for Sabaton? The highlight of 2023 for me personally, I think must have been, I mean, we have been on this like World War One journey for a while now, and we released two albums, a couple of EPs and a bunch of other material around this. But I think it culminated uh, in November uh, of 2023 with the, the History Rocks project, where there was a, um, our movie that we created based on the latest album was shown uh, in over 140 museums around the world. And uh, I think that was a very exciting moment for me personally, being very involved in it. And also for the, for the band, I would say, I mean, it's uh, definitely one of the biggest things we did this year. So sadly, we've now come to the end of our Tankmas Christmas stream. So I'd like to thank everyone who's watched and I'd like to thank my co-hosts, Richard and David. Thank you very much you. for uh, coming to the Tank Museum and joining us this evening. Uh, and of course, a massive thank you to all of you out there for taking your time out to watch this. We have to, of course, thank Nick, the museum, all the staff at the museum, everybody here who we'd, we'd love to, perhaps we could turn a camera around, you could see some of the guys there, is that possible? Maybe not, maybe they're all camera shots. <laughs> they're all asleep. They can have a look. Which Thanks is for so <laughs> contributors. All the hard all work behind the scenes there. Um, and of course, also thank you to David. Uh, and thank you all to all of you for sticking around, watching, tuning in, taking part, entering to the giveaways, making sure you enjoy your drops. I also want to thank Nick and the museum for giving me an excellent ride this morning. It was an absolute pleasure, my first time in your a tank. Your first ever tank ride. Yeah. And it was a ride in which vehicle? The Tiger 131, which I will <laughs> not forget anytime soon. You shouldn't have told uh, me yeah, that. It's a Tiger 131 <laughs> ride and it was amazing. Thank you so much. I, I was joined by a colleague and it was a great pleasure. And I. Yeah, the final words will go to you. Uh, it's always a, always a pleasure to have you. So, yeah, thanks again just to all of our contributors and our guests. Uh, remember that Tankfest tickets are available now. If you'd like to see the FE4005 running around the arena, as we hope it will, get your tickets now. And also the Tank Museum online shop is still open for any last-minute Christmas shopping. Uh, so finally, to play us out, we've got Sabaton with a music video for their song, Christmas Truce. Thanks for joining us. Merry Christmas.
After many months on the battlefield And we were used to the violence Then all the candles went silent And the snow fell Voices sang to me from no man's land Turns the ground white, hear carols from the trenches.